What is Eurasia? Is it just a supercontinent with shared history, common culture, and an interconnected economy? We believe Eurasia is about cooperation. The Eurasian cooperation is the key to form a sustainable future through competitive economy, digitalization, circular economy, with new financial hubs and investment strategies, mobilizing human capital and reforging supply chains. That's why the Eurasia Forum Budapest brought back this phenomenon to the global dialogue to uncover many aspects of economic connectivity and cultural linkages between Europe and Asia, to sharing best practices with high-level keynotes fireside chats, thematic panels, full of fresh interpretations, the new aspects of sustainability, competitiveness, and international cooperation. Four years, more than 150 speakers, 21 panel discussions, more than 20,000 participants. The Central Bank of Hungary welcomes you at the 4th Budapest Eurasia Forum. Pleasure to greet you all at the Budapest Eurasia 2022 Hybrid Conference. My name is Chenga Gabriele Boya, and I will be your host today and tomorrow at this important event. The Budapest Eurasia Forum is one of the flagship events of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary, as it resonates as it resonates with MMB's efforts for strengthened cooperation between Europe and Asia that is based on friendship, solidarity, and mutual trust. Supporting this approach, there are more and more speakers and institutions joining us year after year. This year, we have 48 speakers from 18 different countries and several new partners joining us. We would like to express our gratitude to the Bau Forum for Asia, the official monetary and financial institutions forum, the Fadan Development Institute, the Shanghai Forum, the House of the European House of Ambrosetti, the Singapore FinTech Festival, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, the Eurasia Business and Economic Society, and the Eurasia Forum in Politics, Economics and Business. As the world tries to live with COVID-19, we have planned and organized a hybrid event, bringing back some of the personal encounters of European and Asian thinkers to Budapest, the capital of Hungary, in the heart of Central and Eastern Europe. Taking advantage of digital solutions developed during the pandemic, 
we give participants for whom a personal attendance was not feasible the opportunity to join us online. We hope that in this way, the Budapest Eurasia Forum initiative will be able to reach tens of thousands of people across the continent. This year's forum is held under the theme of sustainable growth and cooperation, how to win at the 21st century. As we aim to examine Eurasian cooperation from a sustainability point of view. The forum's program starts with a high loving opening session where senior decision makers and top professionals will share their visions on international affairs and the importance of the Budapest Eurasia Forum initiative. Continuing with the regular program, we plan for a two-day event with a fully-fledged multidisciplinary program, including six thematic panel discussions, recalling the core areas of the forum concept. While today's discussions will cover finance, geopolitics and infrastructure, connectivity and technology, tomorrow we'll have speakers who will talk about the most actual topics of economy, multilateral cooperation and education. This year, we are proud that this building, MMB's headquarters, serves as the next venue for the new Silk Road, Time, Space and Existence exhibition, for which the official opening will be held after the opening ceremony in the framework of the Budapest Eurasia Forum. Now, I am proud to announce the first speaker of the high-level session, Mr. Jörg Matoeci, Governor of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary. Please help me welcome his opening address. Excellencies, um, dear fellow governor, dear minister Chak, um, distinguished um, uh, members of the Hungarian business community and the Hungarian banking sector, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fourth Budapest Eurasia Forum. Uh, we are lucky enough uh, to have uh, this forum here uh, and we can meet personally. It is, of course, a hybrid uh, conference. Um, we have a full online live coverage uh, to spread the key messages and memes to everyone. As uh, we see, uh, we have an impressive, really impressive list uh, of distinguished speakers, uh, 48 distinguished uh, speakers from uh, 18 countries. It's quite something. It is evolution from the start to the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the main topic is the message. We need for all of us, for uh, the whole global business community, the recipe, the secret recipe for sustainable growth via cooperation. The structure is the message. That's the secret of uh, uh, the famous DNA. This, the structure of our meeting is the message. We cover six uh, uh, main topics uh, all together under the umbrella of um, the sustainability and under the umbrella of uh, the uh, sustainable growth and cooperation. As we know uh, from um, the excellent uh, American philosopher and uh, communication guru, uh, Luhan, uh, Mac, uh, Marshall McLuhan, that uh, the uh, process is the message. The process at, at that time was, was the electric process and that was the message. It is the message by now. What about our uh, procedure, technology? It is dialogue. Dialogue means everything. It is the process and dialogue is the message as well. Ladies and gentlemen, um, dear friends, uh, when it comes to the future of uh, the uh, world economy, um, we have to learn a lot from some other friends in some other sciences. I mean uh, physics, mainly physics and biology. 
they teach us valuable or invaluable lessons about complexity, and we have to learn a lot from uh, the laws of complex systems. When it comes to complex systems, uh, there is one point, we are after that, uh, when um, we need rules and patterns. In the lack of rules and patterns, we can uh, lose everything. I mean, uh, according to um, chaos theory, which is not the theory of chaos, it is the theory how to avoid chaos. Well, so according um, to uh, chaos theory, um, in all complex systems, we have two types of feedbacks, positive and uh, negative um, feedbacks. Uh, as for positive feedbacks, uh, we can accelerate our path in the, in the same direction. It is the transition, the green transition, and the transition to a sustainable economy. It is the digital transition, and all other transitions, uh, including the fusion of knowledge, talent, technology, and capital. These are the valuable, may I just tend to say, uh, invaluable uh, um, uh, fusions and patterns and rules of complex systems. However, uh, in terms of the rules of the uh, complex system, cycles are very important patterns. You, we, we all know that we've got uh, two seven-year cycles. Uh, one of them is good, uh, booming uh, economies, uh, uh, good days, sunshine. The other seven-year cycle is, well, I, 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 uh, it's not bad, but it is harder, rainy days, so we have to fight all the uh, all the um, all the elements uh, to avoid uh, any catalog of disasters. As we know, we've been uh, navigating uh, since uh, 2020 in the second type of uh, of seven years uh, uh, cycles. Uh, it's harder. Uh, it's rainy. Uh, uh, bumpy roads are ahead of us. But we also have some. Um, medium-term cycles, uh, it is, uh, on one hand, it is the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, 50-year cycle. According to that cycle, we relieve some patterns of the 1970s. Means everything, high inflation, low growth, and so on. And we also tend to relieve the according to the 80 year cycle, the, uh, uh, the 1940s, we are just in the uh, first part of it. Um, but there is war in Europe, there are calamities, there are catalog of disasters are coming. So when it comes to uh, complex systems, yes, we need all the, we, we need to know all the rules and patterns. There is one good news, or there are many good news, but I would like to share uh, one good news with you. Uh, uh, it is that, uh, yes, uh, patterns tend to repeat itself. Yes. But all patterns are fractals, and fractals are the same, same but different. So we have the chance to reshape the systems. We have the uh, chance uh, to avoid the ex ex extremely uh, uh, disasters of the 70s and the 40s via uh, sustainability, via sustainable growth with the help of cooperation. I wish you uh, a pleasant stay in Hungary and a very fruitful and efficient conference here in Budapest. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Governor Matoeci. As always, your thought-provoking speech is always a great start to the annual forum. Now, as the first guest speaker of the high-level opening session, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Janos Czak, 
Minister of Culture and Innovation of Hungary, who will share his motivating thoughts on the importance of Eurasian cooperation. Please welcome Minister Czech on stage. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Governor, distinguished guests. It's really a privilege to be here today at this very important uh, conference. My ministry is culture and innovation, called culture and innovation. And uh, I traveled the world and looked up uh, the websites of different governments. I couldn't find one anywhere else in the world. Hungarians are really innovative. The, and this is why I think it's, it's right and proper that, that we discuss culture innovation in the light of sustainability and cooperation. The, when you build a road, first you have to decide where that road would lead. And secondly, why you want to be there. You can build a road, a belt, a silk road even. Uh, first, we have to answer the questions why. And then we can find solutions. Uh, we can discuss the hows. Now, I think the competition between the Atlantic and the Pacific area, between the European Union, US, and Asian powerhouses, is about how we can answer the questions why we do things. And let me shed light on what we in the Hungarian government think about this. And this is not a new phenomenon. Over the last uh, 30 years, since we uh, uh, stepped out from the communist system, in the last 16 years, in the Fidesz-led, the conservative governments, this was the philosophy behind any of our measures. Because we believe that there are fundamental human needs that are timeless and spaceless. The first one is attachment or belonging. According to the evolutionary psychologists, this is the deepest human need. And even in sometimes extremely individualistic countries like the United States. The United States citizens are ready to sacrifice their life for the concept of the United States. Individualistic country, but there is some deep in heart belonging that for which you even sacrifice your life. Or take another US example, the charities. The U.S. society is the most charitable society. And uh, why you would give money for your neighbor or for your uh, father neighbor or uh, some suffering people all around the world? Because you feel some attachment. This is the deepest. So when you are in government or any uh, organization that have an impact of, of a significant number of people, you have to consider how you help people, how can you help people to nurture their attachments and belongings. The second timeless and spaceless human need is care. Care not in a paternalistic way, but care as freedom to care about ourselves, to care about our loved ones and our community. Now, what a government can do then help people to care about themselves. Then the government's job is less and less. <laughs> Let me quote uh, one of my champions, Ronald Reagan, who said that if someone knocking on the door, you open and they say that uh, I am from the government, I am here to help, then shut the door. The government role is to help individuals and families to care about themselves, and that, that is a good society where people can rely on their own 
abilities, resources, and luck. Over the last 30 years, Hungary uh, witnessed two wars. In the 90s, we had the Yugoslavian war, and now we have a major war next to our border. So I don't need to emphasize the importance of peace and security. If a government cannot provide peace and security for its population, for its citizens, then they cannot open a shop. They cannot even let their children or grandchildren go to school. So that's the government role. And finally, even if you have all of these, if you don't appreciate it, if you don't have a balance, individual, in the heart, but also macroeconomic, like the Gini index and others, if you cannot have that kind of balance, then you cannot appreciate neither the attachments or belongings, nor the ability to care, and nor the peace and security. So this is the mindset behind what we do as Hungarian government. And unless you clarify the why, you cannot decide how to do it. And the hard to do is, in any government, we have to tackle three issues. The first is, how do we reproduce ourselves? And in fact, in the human history, the reproduction is happening in families, most of the time. So therefore, when a government tries to gover govern a, a, a country, that's the first and utmost. Let me give you an example. I don't know whether have you have seen the latest uh, South Korean data, fertility rate. A country to, or a nation to reproduce itself, you need 2.1 uh, kids per fertile women, woman. You know what is that number in South Korea today? One of the most successful country in the world, financially and otherwise? 0.8. Some, something is happening. How come that the Koreans don't want to share their fortune with the next generation? So this is why family and family policies are important. Second one, we talk about technology, sustainability, and, and these things. But these things are not things by themselves. They are just things to make life easier. In my portfolio, I have innovation, enterprise uh, development, vocational training. That's where we try to, uh, to make life easier, try to find solutions. And finally, and this is interconnected with the fertility, we, we have our individual life but we have to make sure that we give the baton to the next generations. So therefore, we have to nurture institutions that overarch generations. And that are traditionally are our churches, our educational institutions like universities, and as the human race is concerned, science. What we share, our beliefs, our knowledge, and I think the competition and the cooperation between the different parts of the world will be decided based upon uh, who can better address those deep human needs. When I look at performances of the governments, my background is finance and sociology. Obviously, I, I look at the data for budget, uh, uh, balance of payment, unemployment, inf uh, uh, inflation, and, and so on. But when I look deeper, I look at whether they can tackle this. Now, let me share uh, uh, two, three things that keeps me awake in the night. First of all, the fertility rate in Hungary is 1.6. 12 years ago, it was just 1.2, the lowest in Europe. So the Hungarian government started thinking about, OK, how we can help individuals and couples to, uh, to, tackle, to, to have children. 
And uh, as I said, from 1.2, we reached 1.6, but uh, we don't stop. Uh, right now, in, in the European Union, the first child on average is conceived when the woman is uh, 29 years old. Now, as, as this age pushed further in the 30s, the chance to have a second child or third child is less and less. So therefore, our measures are, are directed into the direction to help young people to decide earlier. The second one is the uh, enabling choice. In the 20th century, and in particular in, since the last 50 years, the labor market's open. Most, lot, lots of women, rightly so, uh, wants to uh, work in the labor market. So a, a sustainable system should keep a balance between the labor and the family life and open it up for the men as well. If someone, for example, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a kindergarten uh, 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 supporter. And uh, unfortunately, I, I couldn't make it because at that time, man was not really allowed into that job. So I nurture a ministry now. But anyway, so that, that uh, the second is enabling choice. And the third is the financial adjustment through the family taxation system and, and other tools. And this is important because if you look at your own country's data, and this was the same here in Hungary between, before 2010, if you had a family and children, your average unit uh, 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 revenue or income in the household was much lower than in single families. So the, I'm not saying that it should be the same because there is a scale of economy, obviously, but having children shouldn't be a penalty in life. Otherwise, we cannot give forward the button to the next generations. And uh, I'm not talking about only uh, Korea, but look at the Japanese numbers, or look at the Western European numbers. Now, what keeps me awake is there is this economic concept of uh, middle-income trap. Middle-income trap is coming from the fact that the domestic economy, the domestic companies, don't integrate into the, uh, into the uh, whole economy. There is a dual economy. Therefore, there is a, a smaller part of the GDP that is domestic value added. Now, how can you have a strong middle class that support the education and the healthcare system if you don't have a strong SME, small and medium-sized uh, 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 part of the economy that, that is domestic. So when I look at other countries, I always look at the GDP data, but I look at the GNI, and I look at the domestic value added. And as you can see in Hungary, we have a real dual economy. And our ambitious goal is to increase the uh, domestic uh, part of our GDP GNI and uh, uh, going forward. Unless we won't be able to support our family policy. There is no family policy without a vibrant and robust domestic economy. Family, enterprise, innovation and science. I talked about scale of economies. Uh, we have to create critical mass. Right now, this, this is a, a statistics from the European Union. Uh, in Hungary, we have some 6,231 uh, research and developers uh, by million inhabitants. If you look at the, uh, uh, the best countries in, in Europe, it's, it's around 9,000. And we need that. This is why I am responsible for the higher education as well, to enable to have more uh, uh, research and developers, both in life sciences and in, in, uh, in natural sciences, that are spread not only in the multinational companies, the 
the G's, the Bosch's, the, uh, the Huawei's of the world, but also in the, in the SME sector. It's a must. Again, if you don't have innovation, you cannot have a robust economy, you cannot support your public services and families. Then you got the demographic autumn. And this is why I work on the cultural field, because the Hungarian government don't think about culture as pictures and concerts. We think about culture as a mindset, as a way of life, as a way of thinking that nurtures and, and gives basis uh, for the economy. Higher education I talked about, we spend a lot for culture, 1.3% of our GDP. The European average is 0.5. We spend a lot in developing our higher educational system, not only in operating costs, but, but infrastructure as well. And finally, oftentimes, the vocational training is neglected. It's really important. Vocational training, if you don't have plumbers, if you don't have mechanics, I mean in modern terms, you cannot build a, a balanced society. We introduced a new system based on the American and German experiences, and uh, I'm happy to say that it's working pretty well, and even from the vocational training, there is a route towards the uh, university education. Uh, I already ran out of my time. I would love to share you even more, but uh, this was it today. I urge you to check my statements in the Hungarian statistics and wish you a very fruitful discussion. And I would like to congratulate the governor for pulling this together. Sándor Lánfalusi, the uh, uh, was a great friend of mine, and I just mentioned to the, to the governor that Shandor is looking at us from above, and he is happy that we are here. Have a good uh, conference. <laughs>
and record high public and private debt. For small open economies, especially those from emerging markets like us, the challenge is to maintain stability in the face of more volatile capital flows, large swings in exchange rates, and tighter global financial conditions. The steep appreciation of the US dollar poses significant risks, particularly for those countries with higher external vulnerability. Many have had to follow the aggressive tightening of policy by the Fed. That said, the overall repercussions of advanced economy policy tightening on global financial markets have, thus far, been remarkably orderly. There have been no major dislocations in emerging market capital flows, and there has been clear differentiation based upon country-specific fundamentals. Asian economies overall have exhibited resilience. Capital outflows have been less intense than during the taper tantrum and the initial COVID shock in 2020. Currency movements have largely mirrored US dollar appreciation. Part of this reflects stronger fundamentals and large buffers, including things like deeper local markets, sound fiscal positions, high foreign reserves, well-capitalized banks, low foreign currency debt, and lower foreign holdings of local assets. How small open economies should respond varies by country, depending upon their context. Countries with stronger policy frameworks, sound external internal finances, and a broader range of tools encompassing foreign exchange intervention and macro prudential measures are in a better position to manage the risk and trade-offs resulting from tighter global financial conditions. In Thailand, for example, our circumstances have allowed us to take a more gradual and measured approach towards policy normalization. The second challenge is the shifting international trade and geopolitical landscape. The need to build more resilient supply chains, coupled with the more polarized international environment, has given greater emphasis to deglobalization, or at the very least, reglobalization. A survey of Fortune 1000 companies found that 94% experienced problems from supply chain disruptions from COVID-19. The likely trend towards reshoring, nearshoring, and friendshoring is leading to potential reconfigurations of global supply chains. The economies of Southeast Asia are particularly exposed to such reconfigurations as they have high participation in global value chains but are located mostly downstream in these value chains and thereby face higher risks of being left out. At the same time, greater importance attached to ESG considerations have led to new standards and expectations, new global rules of the game, about how countries can and should participate in international trade. For small open economies, the challenge is to find their place in the rapidly evolving international trade landscape. How should they position themselves between the major trading partners? To what extent can regional trading blocks help to increase their voice in the international arena? What are the best opportunities to plug themselves in the new configuration of global supply chains? Small open economies can best navigate and benefit from the shifting trade landscape by keeping their outward orientation, strengthening domestic institutions, and undertaking structural reforms that will enhance flexibility. This would allow them to harness technology, to upgrade their production capabilities, and adapt to new trade patterns, including integration to evolving global supply chains. Services trade, especially in intermediate services, like telecommunications and IT management, offer larger growth potential. As world trade bounces back following the pandemic, opportunities for exports of services are likely to exceed those in goods. Active engagement in bilateral and regional free trade agreements will also help to diversify the trade base. Our economies must also quickly adopt to the new global rules of the game. The impetus towards carbon neutrality is a case in point. Production in the export sectors must quickly adapt to comply with internationally accepted standards. Policymakers and the financial sector can and must help in this transition. The third challenge is digitalization and the erosion of national boundaries. The rapid digitalization of trade and finance has transformed our economies in terms of who is participating, how business is done, how rapidly competition moves, and where economic benefits are flowing. Borders are being eroded and becoming more porous due to technology. Trade and financial services 
can increasingly be offered from entities residing offshore or even by entities that do not exist, as in the case of DeFi. This creates potentially large gaps in our regulatory perimeters. Trade and services may be occurring without appropriate oversight and protection of consumers. The emergence of crypto assets, stable coins, digital tokens are a case in point. Many firms have innovative business models that existing regulatory structures might not yet have considered. The increased role of big tech firms and globalized digital platforms raises important challenges in terms of data governance and competition. We have seen the unparalleled concentration of digital services in the hands of a few global big tech firms. These global digital platforms pose particular challenges for small economies as they can dominate and crowd out local service providers, which are likely to struggle to compete with the economies of scale of the big tech firms, especially in terms of data collection. We also face challenges in the areas of security and privacy. Major players in the tech space have faced substantial data breaches in recent years. National standards for data privacy and security are needed to protect consumers, reinforce civil rights, and safeguard the nation's cybersecurity. Small open economies must adapt and leverage on these digitalization trends. Though the larger advanced economies will likely continue to be the leaders, the door has opened to more countries and to smaller companies and startups. Our regulatory frameworks must be flexible enough to facilitate the emergence of new local players with innovative solutions while at the same time ensuring that competition is fair, markets are contestable, and consumers are protected. Excellencies, distinguished participants, the above are only some of the many challenges facing small open economies in the changing global landscape. While each of our circumstances and the solutions we adopt to address those challenges will differ, the spirit of cooperation and exchange represented by the topics to be discussed at the Eurasia Forum will be essential in helping us to navigate the narrow and difficult path ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Governor Setaput, for giving us such a comprehensive and inspiring speech. Now, as the next speaker of the high-level session, please welcome Ms. Yun Zhu, Chairwoman of the Silk Road Fund. Before joining the fund, Ms. Zhu worked for the People's Bank of China as Director General of its International Department and gained extensive experience in financial sector openness, global economic and financial governance, international financial cooperation and regulation, as well as international economics and finance. Please welcome Mitsu's video speech. Distinguished Governor, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to address the Budapest Euro-Asia Forum. On behalf of the Silk Road Fund, I would like to share with you some of my thoughts on sustainable investment and green development. Much has changed since the launch of the forum in 2019. The world economy is facing greater uncertainty due to COVID and the Russian-Ukraine crisis. The risk of stagflation has increased, and the processes of deglobalization, supply chain adjustment, and energy transition have sped up. Moreover, extreme weather events are taking their toll around the world. The heat waves, droughts, and floods have highlighted our common challenge for sustainable development and the urgency of fulfilling the sustainable development goals. But gaps remain. By UN estimation, to achieve SDGs, the annual financing gap between 2020 and 2030 is about 5.6 trillion US dollars. To fill the gap, funds from multilateral organizations, governments, private capital, and all relevant parties need to be mobilized. 
Fortunately, the strategy of sustainable investment is evolving and better understood by investors. In the early stage, sustainable investment simply excludes unsustainable companies or sectors from a portfolio. As for now, it has been integrated into the entire investment process, seeking to produce positive effects rather than merely averting negative impacts. Meanwhile, more investors recognize that with sustainable investment, they could help build a better future without compromising better returns. In 2021, more than 1,000 institutional investors signed the UNPRI, 33% more than 2020, demonstrating greater private sector alignment. The Silk Road Fund is a practitioner and promoter of sustainable investment. By definition, equity investment could improve projects' financing structure and mobilize more funds from the private sector and commercial banks alike. Therefore, equity investors could play a more important role in filling the financing gap for sustainable development. The Silk Road Fund has always honored the philosophy of openness, cooperation, sustainability, and innovation since its establishment. We mainly focus on medium to long-term direct equity investment among a variety of investment instruments. To build a green silk road, the fund has integrated sustainable principles into corporate governance, investment decision-making, and the management system. This year, under the board of directors, we established a sustainable investment committee responsible for mapping sustainable investment policies and guidelines. Guided by the committee, we've already formulated our sustainable investment policy, aligning our governance, investment, and operation with UN SDGs. Meanwhile, we've started measuring the carbon footprint of our operations and investment portfolios, and we plan to disclose more relevant information in the near future. Euro-Asia is a crucial economic region along the Belt and Road Corridor and also an important partner for our investment. In 2017, we set up the China-EU Core Investment Fund together with the European Investment Fund. This core investment fund mainly invests in private equity funds and venture capital funds that support SMEs in Europe. We've also invested in China Central and Eastern Europe Investment Fund too, with China Exim Bank and the Hungarian Export Import Bank. This fund mainly invests in infrastructure, agriculture, biopharmaceutical and manufacturing projects in European emerging countries. The Euro-Asian economies vary in their resource endowments and development stages and complement each other in their industrial advantages. The Silk Road Fund is ready to strengthen dialogue with our current and potential partners in Euro-Asia and from around the world. Joining hands, we can better explore sustainable investment opportunities and achieve mutually beneficial development. Finally, some observations and recommendations. At present, top-down and bottom-up are the two major approaches to promoting sustainable development. China and the EU adopt the top-down approach, which is government-led laws regulators to supervise sustainable issues. The regulators offer the carrots of subsidies and tax cuts to encourage sustainable investment and use the sticks of standards, disclosure, and other requirements to discourage non-compliance. 
The U.S. adopts the bottom-up approach, which is market-led with the regulator watching closely but without taking any actions. The Fed, for example, stated that it does not make climate change policy. This approach internalizes sustainable factors via market prices signals to achieve a more efficient allocation of resources. To promote sustainable investment, the market should play a key role, such as the carbon emission trading systems in the EU and China, and the natural capital account that the US government is going to introduce. These market me mechanisms would encourage firms and investors to consider sustainable issues from a cost-benefit perspective. For example, the well-functioning of the carbon credit market will incentivize enterprises to re reduce carbon emissions. However, the caveat is we should not expect profit-driven capital to automatically save the planet. Some sustainable funds still have massive holdings in the carbon-intensive sectors. This is where clear policy signals and guidance have a role to play. Be it top-down or bottom-up, it is necessary to strengthen international cooperation to forge synergy in promoting sustainable investment, particularly in three fundamental areas, to help reduce the risk of greenwashing and regulatory arbitrage. First, on taxonomy, China and Europe are at the forefront. In June, the International Platform for Sustainable Finance released a new version of the Common Ground Taxonomy, including 72 climate mitigation activities recognized by China and the EU to enhance the comparability and compatibility of cross-border green financing activities. Singapore, the UK and other IPSF members have expressed intent to join in the work on taxonomy in the next phase. Second, on disclosure, recommendations by the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD, have gained worldwide influence. By end August, around 3,400 corporations and financial institutions have expressed support for TCFD recommendations. The climate disclosure standards in the EU, Germany, France, and the UK are all in line with TCFD recommendations. The International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation also released exposure draft on climate-related disclosure built upon TCFD recommendations. It will issue the new standards by the end of this year. Third, on third-party rating, along with rapid growth of sustainable investment, sustainable rating is developing fast. However, the issue of instability and uh, heterogeneity of rating results is yet to be addressed. Rating agencies acquire sustainable information, mainly from enterprise disclosures documents, surveys, and news. The rating system covers ESG indicators and other detailed indicators. Due to huge differences in cultures, target clients, and organizational structures, rating agencies differ a lot in interest orientation and value judgment. Therefore, it is imperative to bridge the differences. Further, international cooperation will create a favorable external environment for sustainable investment. Financial institutions should walk the talk by fully integrating sustainability into operation and management, such as including sustainable issues in the agenda of the board, evaluating sustainability risks both qualitatively and quantitatively, 
and monitoring and assessing sustainability risks. The Silk Road Fund stands ready to participate in and promote sustainable investment. We look forward to working with all parties to address the climate change challenges and forge ahead toward a green future. Finally, I wish the forum a complete success. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jun Zhu, for your kind video message. As the final speaker of the opening ceremony, please welcome Professor Ambassador Mr. Simon Tay, Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs. Mr. Tay is a public intellectual as well as an advisor to major corporations and policymakers. He has been the Chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs since 1999 and has held several other positions and a number of public appointments, including nominated Member of Parliament. Please welcome Mr. Tay's speech. Good morning, Governor, ladies and gentlemen, your Excellencies. I want to thank you in person for inviting me to be here in Budapest. Last year, I took part virtually, and while that was a very enjoyable experience, I thought this is my, ruined my chance to be here in Budapest. I'm delighted to be here. I was thinking of this in-person meeting and the way that both the minister and governor have spoken. I was wondering how we should try to talk about these key issues at a high level early in the morning. As experts and policymakers, or more as fellow human beings. If I may, I'll try to do a bit of the latter. First, I feel that this few months since the start of this year, we've really come through a new dimension of crisis. There are multiple crises which have been foreseen before, but are now really unfolding and accelerating. I know this comes after many crises before, especially the pandemic. I feel sometimes that we are uh, the survivors of a shipwreck, but now on the shore of a new and quite perhaps difficult continent, not island, where survival cannot be taken for granted. These few months in particular, with so many you know, floods in China and yet droughts as well, fires here in Europe, so many financial and other uncertainties, climate, finance, wars, things that perhaps in an earlier time we might have thought not possible, are here. And I'm afraid that sometimes I feel the next few, last few months have been the time we really start to see the future, not just for our immediate future, but things that will unfold for our children and really the future that we may not want. How do we respond? I think in a much more uh, peaceful, ideal world, the necessity is cooperation, as the governor and the forum stands for. Dialogue, as we're having here today, immediate attention given to pressing problems, but also a continuing longer-term commitment. These would be the bedrock of any multilateral international response. We, of course, would need new rules. Uh, the world is adjusting. I come from a part of the world that's growing dynamically, though not without challenges. And we see that this hunger, this need for new rules in, for govern all relations, but also in new areas like digital, uh, carbon, all these require us to sit down and work together with an ethos which depends on a sense of solidarity, of common concern about this future and in a way of shared purpose of what we must do as a very globalized society, a globalized economy. While that sounds ideal, the realism today is that there is a great tension in the world, primarily, in a way, the Sino-American tension, which has grown from a tension in the 2000s and the global financial crisis to really what point where we see a clear competition 
points of contention, and after some visits to Taiwan by American politicians. The talk of potential conflict is no longer some nightmare scenario, but a potential reality. In this process of seeing the world come into this sense of competition and potential conflict, we focus really very much on power rather than rules, on selfish sense of security where everything is somehow securitized for me. For everyone who says, you know, my country first, it means everybody else is second. And this sense of uh, uh, selfish security and power is not just at the international level, but increasingly within our society. Inequality within society has been a huge issue. But now with the horses of inflation, the inequality will be accelerating. And this social economic challenges within the country will interact with what the national policies are to the rest of the world. So my concern is that really we are seeing a, a tremendous uh, shift and change in globalization with the supply chains being drawn up, not on rational cost basis, but much more in terms of narrow calculations of self-interest. I know it's rather gloomy. What can smaller states do? And I don't mean just my country, Singapore, or Hungary, but so many countries, which between the giant major powers, all feel somewhat small. I, I want to be old-fashioned and uphold the international rules-based order. The compare kindly said, I've been chairman of the Institute for 22 years. It's actually Singapore's oldest think tank. When I first became chairman, we were struggling with the Asian financial crisis. And as the central bank governor of Thailand has said, our region, in a way, has really been a great student of that era of globalization. We've cleaned up the house, strengthened our books at home, our banking systems, uh, signed on to a large number of free trade agreements, supported and taken part and received benefit from this type of globalization. And therefore, we feel the tide moving against the pattern we're used to. We have to fight this. I know it sounds foolish to fight the tide, but these are man-made currents. They are not beyond the other countries working together. And running out of time, and in the interest of time, I want to also uh, re-echo the key points raised by the speakers before me about sustainability. Because this is something we really need to cooperate on. Sustainability in carbon, factoring not only as moral and green questions, but really at the heart of our key economic and social decision making. And in this, we need to really allow and engage new voices within our societies and between countries. This will be something that really affects all of us and not just the great powers. The steps ahead of us are not new, but they will be difficult to take given the environment. New rules, higher standards uh, in many areas, including sustainability. New areas such as the digital economy, all these will need some degree of top-down leadership, but also a sensing of what companies, uh, what society wants and are able to deliver. In this steps, I believe strongly in Europe and Asia cooperation. The EU, especially with ASEAN, grouping of 10 countries of which Singapore and Thailand is part. We really believe that this can be a fulcrum for helping the other major economies take uh, ownership and leadership, at least about our own rules, to diversify, to be open and inclusive, and to form a new kind of non-alignment not the old Cold War alignment, non-alignment, but hopefully one that is flexible, functional, and rational to create a new set of rules for what is either going to be a much worse world or perhaps one that will be proud to leave to coming generations. Thank you.
Okay, we truly appreciate your enlightening speech. With the speech of Professor Ambassador Mr. Simon Tay, we have reached the end of the high-level opening ceremony, and it is my pleasure to move to the official opening of the new Silk Road Time, Space and Existence exhibition. These pieces reflect how Europe and Asia connect along the historical Silk Road, with its landscapes and main hallmarks all integrated into the modern Silk Roads. They show us how different traditions and cultures coexist and how they enable modern flow of energy, information and goods. Ms. Clea Fernandez, Director of Global Forum Resources, and one of the artists, Mr. Juan Luis Morales, to deliver their keynote speech. It is a great pleasure to be here with you for the opening of the Silk Road exhibition, which my colleagues and I at Global Forum Resources in Paris organized with the goal of providing a broad view of the Silk Road across time, space, and existence. I want to address my sincere and deep appreciation to the Central Bank of Hungary for hosting this exhibition on the occasion of the Budapest Eurasia Forum, which fits so perfectly with the theme of this exhibition. I also want to thank the two artists, known as Atelier Morales, who in 2018 made an exhausting land journey across 14,000 kilometers by car through seven countries, starting in Shanghai, and ending in Hamburg, taking thousands of photographs that served as the basis for the exhibition you will see today. The voyage included 45 cities and 100 sites in China, 12 cities and 20 sites in Kazakhstan, 18 cities and 40 sites in Uzbekistan, 12 cities and 25 sites in Azerbaijan, two cities and 10 sites in Belarus, 10 sites in Kaliningrad, and finally, the city and port of Hamburg. The mission that we assigned the team of Paris-based artists, Teresa Ayuso, who could not be here with us today, and Juan Luis Morales, was to provide us with an artistic vision of the vast territory they crossed. We encouraged them to investigate and document the transcendental trade routes that link East and West, to discover the historical landmarks, to capture with the camera 
the rich and unique cultural and architectural legacy. It was a challenge whose success depended on a great deal of cultural sensitivity, patience, but also physical strength. I cannot thank them enough for the exquisite exhibition that they produced, which opened first in Venice for the Art Biennale, and next this past June in Astana at the Museum of the First President, and which we hope from Budapest will continue to travel to other destinations, both in Europe, Asia, and Central Asia. In fact, if any of you are interested in learning more about how to bring the exhibition to your country, please come see me. I will be here for the next two days. And without further delay, I would like to turn it over to Juan Luis Morales so that he can give us some brief introductory remarks about the work. Thank you. Good morning. At the returning from this non stop of 14,000 kilometers by car, described by Claire, we worked for three years between 2019 to 2021 in our, our atelier in Paris, preparing a group of mixed media works in which the result of panoramic photo is printed in the center of a bamboo paper. In the empty space of, uh, that remained all around the image, we drew with pencil and watercolor certain fragments outside of the frame of the photograph that we wanted to evoke. In every photograph, we try to identify, imagine, and highlight traces of the old Silk Road. Through this selection of 30 artwork, we want to encourage dialogue and reflection about the flow of knowledge and goods in today's modern world, and in particular, between Europe, Central Asia, and Asia, where commercial and cultural exchange have existed for generations. The very cities, architecture, landscape, people, cultures, religion, and language that we encountered have the potential to give life to the perennial dream of preserving a world heritage. We hope that in doing so, the fragile balance between space, time, and existence achieved across century will be preserved. Our itinerary, which follow the road taken by Marco Polo and Baron von Richthofen reveal many emblems. That one scene could not be forgotten. Each new encounter pointed to the legendary caravans while also reflecting new form of connectivity for current and future transcontinental trade. We saw the permanent traces left by magnificent past and in constant evolution as we move forward. In each spectacular landscape or city photograph, we became aware for us to capture with our camera. You can see and find more information in the uh, brochure of the exposition. Thank you, thank you for the Central Bank of Hungary, the Budapest Forum, Asia, Eurasia Forum, 
and all of the local staff who have worked in this project. I sincerely hope that you enjoy this exhibition. Thank you. Ms. Fernandez and Mr. Morales, thank you very much for your insights regarding the exhibition. And now, a short break is coming up so our audience here in Budapest can enjoy the exhibition. For the online audience, I encourage you to stay close to the screens as our breaks will feature excellent videos introducing our partners and the initiatives of MMB. We see the opportunities, uh, we see the necessities uh, to launch a new creative uh, vehicle called uh, CBDC. The design features and safeguards around a CBDC, they do have to reflect best internationally prescribed standards, among others for financial stability, cyber resilience, and financial inclusion and access.
for researchers like myself who uh, look at the political economy of finance and financial technology, Shanghai is uh, definitely an important location and one that shouldn't be missed. Uh, so Fudan being in the, at the heart uh, of Shanghai, both at the academic and uh, market side uh, of finance, makes a big difference. Shanghai is uh, definitely a very good destination for foreigners to visit this country and to learn about China. It's been really great to meet so many people across the Fudan community, from undergraduates to graduates to postdoctoral scholars and professors. And I think the space here at FDI is wonderful to work at. I've been able to work at different coffee shops in front of the lawn around Guanghua Lowell in this building and it's just been a wealth of people, ideas and places here that I've been very grateful for. As a university academic, there's a danger that we would stay in a small circle of people who think the same way, that we live in the library. FDDI as a think tank was very useful for me to uh, meet people in the business sector, meet people in political sectors and I could bring their opinions into my research. The international environment for the job market is uh, very difficult uh, at the moment for early career scholars and I really wanted something that would give me an edge. Uh, and in fact, the FDDI program provided me with that edge. What I liked about FDDI was that I, I had a chance to meet other experts of several areas and also the audience at my two presentations uh, was quite interactive, which I liked. For example, at my presentation about the, how the Belt and Road Initiative impacts the energy security of China, we discussed security issues involved. Uh, we have a very unique style of work here. It's very friendly, academic, highly recreational and uh, interchanging. For example, we go out and see places uh, we share our experiences of life together, we take photographs, we take videos, and then we laugh. So at FDDI, there was a lot of freedom to work. We had good facilities. The staff was really, really helpful. I think if you really want to do any good visiting fellowship in China, uh, FDDI gives you the best. It's pretty clear that, uh, that China and Shanghai and Fudan University is a very, very, very dynamic place. have uh, never experienced such a dynamic uh, institution. As, uh, as Fudan University, and that's also encouraging um, for me. China is um, a leading power in um, economy, but uh, becoming very soon, I guess, also a leading power in academic research and teaching. The program is an epitome of the diversity in Fudan. We have brilliant people from both academia and uh, industry, and we have achievements in both research and uh, practices. Diversity is always the key word here in FDDI, and that is why how we win top talents and inspire great ideas here. Connecting, connecting people, people, sharing, sharing knowledge. knowledge. Connecting, connecting people, people, sharing, sharing knowledge. knowledge. Connecting people, sharing knowledge. knowledge. OMFIF, the official monetary and financial institutions forum, is an independent think tank for central banking, economic policy, and public investment. A neutral platform for best practice in worldwide public and private sector engages. With teams in London, Singapore and the US, OMFIV focuses on global policy and investment themes relating to central banks, sovereign funds, pension funds, regulators and treasuries. Global public investors with investable assets of $39.5 trillion are at the heart of our network. Membership offers insight through analysis and meetings. OMFIF analysis draws on expertise from our in-house specialists and a global network of public and private sector members. Many OMFIF meetings held under the OMFIF rules take place within central banks and other official institutions.
Over the last year, we have hosted high-level speakers, including the Chief Economist of the ECB, Federal Reserve Bank Presidents, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, the President of the Deutsche Bundesbank, and the Chief Economist at GIC, Singapore's Sovereign Fund. To join us as a member or to find out more, email Chris Ostrowski, Chief Revenue Officer, on the address on the screen. Shanghai Forum 2021 is requested to accumulate the collective wisdom indispensable in drawing a new future-oriented roadmap to guide a path ahead for Asia and the global community. As I'm highlighted by this year's theme, the Asia has an important role to play. The Asia demonstrated a remarkable resilience during the pandemic. We need the and my main theme, which I like to emphasize always, is global cooperation. This is no time for geopolitical conflict. Uh, this is no time for divisions between the major powers. This is the time for global cooperation. If, if all of us, 7.8 billion are on the same goal, and then we are suffering these common problems of COVID-19, we are suffering the common problems of climate change, and what we should be doing is cooperating. The pandemic has shown that the distance from basic research to innovation is indeed shorter than we often envisage. We believe that science and innovation will be strengthened through a more continuous collaboration. The the dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, the Chinese RMB, and so forth, the pound, British pound, will all have a digital version. That's what we call CBDC. These are sovereign currencies. These will be the dominant force in the new global monetary system. Now,新冠疫情仍在世界范围内肆虐，我们比以往任何时候都更加迫切的需要相互的沟通与理解，团结与协作。
Geopolitics, History, Economics. The book titled American Empire vs. European Dream by Gerd Matolci, the governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, has been released. Providing a broad perspective, it analyzes the process of how the American Empire became the world's number one superpower, what motivations other major players in geopolitics had, how the European Union attempted to compensate the hegemon status of the American Empire, and how the European dream shattered at the dawn of a new world order. You can find the answers to these questions, as well as many important and topical issues, in Gyurgy Matolci's new book, which has already achieved international success. The book is available in bookstores or online, in the web shop of Paulos Atene Publishing House, or on Amazon.com. The world is in change. Global pandemic. Volatile financial market. Trade decline. The world is in change. Global pandemic. Volatile financial market. Trade decline. How does Asia lead the world's economy in the new era? Boal Forum for Asia Annual Conference 2022. Together for development and a shared future for all. In October 1972, representatives from across the world met in London to sign the Charter establishing the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, known as YASA. It was the culmination of six years' effort by US President Lyndon Johnson and USSR Premier Alexei Kozygin and marked the beginning of a remarkable project to use scientific cooperation to build bridges across the Cold War divide and to confront growing global problems on an international scale. YASA was forged in the name of science diplomacy and today it still regards science diplomacy as a key tool to help build trust between nations and support foreign policies. Science diplomacy um, can succeed when other channels sometimes are not successful. I think the successes that I've seen and sometimes participated in gives me confidence that I think there's always a role to play for science diplomacy. Because I think the one thing that science has managed to do consistently throughout that period was to act as a, as a soft form of diplomacy in a sense. In other words, where it could actually open up doors, start conversations and start bridge building. Science diplomacy 
is shown in three dimensions. First, science for diplomacy. Scientific cooperation improves international relations. Second is science in diplomacy. Science provides advice to inform foreign policy. And third is diplomacy for science, when diplomacy facilitates international scientific cooperation. All these three dimensions are present at EASA. One example is EASA's project called Challenges and Opportunities of Economic Integration within the wider European and Eurasian space. In this project, we focused on the future of economic ties between the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union. The science for diplomacy contribution of EASA in this case was to bring parties with very different views into a dialogue. Through this dialogue, they built trust, which was very critical in the political reality of that time. A recent example of science diplomacy in action at the Institute is the YASA and International Science Council consultative platform. I thank the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the International Science Council for bring us all together for the first advisory board meeting of the EASA ISC consultative platform. And the idea was to learn from what was happening from the COVID-19 crisis, uh, to see if we could look at some of the things that we could preserve. But the most important thing was to try to see if we could prioritize the areas for transformation that could help us to build a more sustainable an equitable world. Uh, within a fairly short period of time, we were able to put together um, online consultations that gathered some 350 experts in science, in, um, in practitioners, and in policymakers. We need to cooperate and collaborate more effectively than ever before. Yes, it has the potential, not just to be a player among others in science diplomacy, but it has the legitimacy to exercise global leadership. As a scientific institution, we can only put the scientific facts on the table. The science is not negotiable. What is negotiable is the way that that's used and the way that different countries or different societies may choose to harness the science for their own benefit. And there's always a little bit of room for maneuver there because at the end of the day, uh, political decision-making is not just about science. It's also about the economy and it's always going to be about people. It's not just about science. I think science needs to make its case and science needs to put its best foot forward. And science needs to try and demonstrate why it's in the interest of societies to adopt uh, a worldview that, uh, that, that uh, embraces science. opening ceremony let us start with the first panel today centered around finance where our guest speakers will discuss the ingredients to success in the financial sector and how to strengthen new financial hubs in Eurasia our century has so far witnessed the emergence of global financial centers to achieve further progress, financial powerhouses must face several new challenges, including non-linear technological development, innovative solutions in finance, and the green dilemma. Successful financial hubs address these questions in a sustainable and inclusive manner, adapting best practices and attracting new investments. But what are the determinants of a successful global financial center, and how can governments strengthen them? How can innovative financial solutions increase competitiveness?
Dear audience, it is my pleasure to greet Mr. Richard Weg, the CEO of the Budapest Stock Exchange. Beside his duties at BSE, Mr. Weg is also the chairman of the sustainability section of the Hungarian Economic Association, while the General Assembly of the Federation of European Securities Exchanges elected him as board member in 2018. Mr. Weg? Mr. Vig, welcome. As CEO of the Budapest Stock Exchange, how can international cooperation within stock exchanges ensure growth and technological development, which is probably the most important trigger word nowadays? Yes, I think first of all it's important to mention that uh, stock exchanges, capital market and the wider financial sector is here to serve the real economy and serve the real people the investment goals and other personal goals of the people. So how international cooperation can facilitate it? I think it's, uh, if we look back like 10, 15 years, regulation, technology and international cooperation were the three main topics which formed the area of uh, stock exchanges around the globe. And uh, the ways how exchanges cooperate, one big international stock exchange groups was performed like in Europe, the Euronext group, which are covered in many countries in Europe, or the NASDAQ group, or the ICE group. Or the other type of cooperation was based on technology, like we, the Budapest Stock Exchange, are using the uh, technology of the Do German exchange, the Deutsche Börse, which is a state-of-the-art IT platform. So in this way, large exchange group can help smaller markets to use the latest technologies, so in, in this way, these markets can be reached by the investors of the world very easily. And uh, maybe thirdly, there are other types, soft type of uh, cooperation as well, like uh, our cooperation with uh, previously the London Stock Exchange, now the Euronext Group, we are uh, working together with Elite to really educate Hungarian companies to get a very good knowledge of how to use the capital markets. So I think that we can learn from each other in the exchange space and uh, there are many types and good ways to cooperate. Thank you so much. That is definitely something worth discussing. So I give you the floor to you and the participants of the first panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. So first of all, uh, it's an honor to uh, be the moderator of this uh, panel. And uh, the topic of the panel, as we heard from the video, is about the ingredients of success for financial sector and uh, the ways how new financial hubs can be grown in Eurasia. So the, we will explore during this session the different uh, uh, s factors that can help uh, countries to develop financial hubs. It can be regulation, it can be technolo technology, or it can be financial stability and maybe sustainability as well. So we will explore it with our colleagues uh, in the panel. But first of all, uh, let me first start with the keynote presentation that is the opening of this financial panel, which will be delivered by Mr. Ali Hassan. Uh, Mr. Hassan is a senior representative for the Dubai International Financial Center, DIFC Authority, in Europe and North America, and senior vice president of business development for the center. In his current role, Mr. Hassan supports the CEO in developing and promoting the innovation, insurance, banks, and capital markets, and also the wealth management sector in line with the center's future of finance strategy, and plays an active role in managing client developments. Mr. Hassan uh, cannot be here with us in person today, so he recorded his video keynote, so please, uh, Together, we listen to Mr. Hassan's keynote. Thank you. Session, and thank you to our hosts, the Central Bank of Hungary, for the invitation to speak at this auspicious forum. I regret I cannot uh, join you in, in person today uh, in the fair city of Budapest. I have a previous commitment to be in Switzerland uh, today, so. Whilst you listen to me today virtually, I'll be speaking in person there. 
technology is really changing how we uh, can engage and operate for the better, I think. By way of background, I've been with the Dubai International Financial Centre, or DIFC, for 17 of its 18-year history. Eight years in Dubai as a senior director with the DFSA, uh, the financial regulator of the DIFC. And the last nine years uh, uh, on the market development side, leading our international coverage, assisting firms to export their expertise, products and solutions to the growth markets of Miasa. Before Dubai, I was with the FSA in the UK and business development roles uh, with Bloomberg, amongst others. So all told, over 30 years of experience in financial services. Suffice to say, I'm delighted to be representing DIFC and providing an introduction for the distinguished panel to follow. To tee up the panel discussion, I would like to cover the following. Firstly, the development of the DIFC and what factors have underpinned our success. Secondly, how we are further evolving to nurture the future of finance and support innovation and sustainability. And thirdly, how we involve private and public uh, sector and funding to help drive business growth for our firms in our community and innovation at the same time. So turning to the development of the DIFC, we were established in 2004 as part of Dubai government's long-term economic strategy. And we are now the largest and deepest financial market in the GCC. Uh, we are ranked number one in the Middle East, Africa, South Asia region, and in the top 20 global financial centers. Uh, we have attracted the who's who in finance, professional services, corporations, and innovation from Europe, North America, and Asia, with close to 4,000 companies and over 32,000 people now based in the center. And the factors that have underpinned our success, I'd highlight three. <clears throat> Firstly, the economic rationale uh, or market opportunity. If you, if you take a step back and look at the global landscape of financial centers, you can see a mix of global international hubs coupled with more uh, domestic, smaller focused uh, locations. Financial centers arise as natural clusters of capital, talent, and expertise in support of economic activity, trade, and demand. So one of the key things that Dubai and DIFC has done well is successfully position itself as a hub for the GCC, a region with significant sovereign and private wealth pools, driven by hydrocarbons, but now heavily diversifying, and for the wider Miasa region, which captures growth economies such as India. Ultimately, therefore, there must be an economic rationale, market demand uh, that a financial center is addressing. Secondly, Dubai and UAE government economic strategy. So the DIFC has been active close to two decades, but Dubai's economic strategy, which underpins the center's attractiveness, has, in, has been in place for over 50 years. So Jebel Ali Port in the 1970s provided a crucial global trade hub, linking trade flows from Asia to the Middle East, Europe and beyond. Over $400 billion of global trade now flows through Dubai. Emirates Airline, uh, created in, in the 1980s, provides the great global connectivity essential for an economy and a financial center. And the 1990s saw an expansion of various economic sectors, including travel and tourism, construction, education, and healthcare, all giving rise to inward investment opportunities but at the same time, providing the hard and soft infrastructure required to support business and to attract global talent, as well as nurture and, and grow uh, domestic talent. So the long term wider economic strategy of Dubai and the UAE has been fundamental to, to the success of the DIFC. Thirdly, innovation and the power of international standards. So to attract international and regional market participants, the adoption of international standards of law and regulation has been key. 
the IFC was the first in the region to adopt a common law based legal system and put in place a financial regulator operating for international norms. In effect, we are a jurisdiction in our own right, a physical area in Dubai, very much part of the UAE, but providing those international standards for financial firms, businesses and innovation companies that create a familiar and certain business environment from which to access the market opportunities of the region. And because we legislate our own laws, we can keep in step with international developments. So we have data protection, insolvency, netting and intellectual property laws, for example. International linkages are very important in giving credibility to local regulations. So the DFSA has over 100 MOUs in place with other regulators and the IFC courts that administer our, our, our legal uh, system also has uh, agreements in place internationally to ensure the enforceability of judgments uh, of our courts. <clears throat> and we have indeed acted as an agent for change in the region, giving rise to aspiring financial centers in Bahrain, Abu Dhabi, Doha and Saudi, which is a good thing, growing the pie for all. So adoption of international standards was a key uh, innovation and success factor and it was amplified by providing a supportive business environment with free flow of capital, welcoming international talent through ease of visas, competitive taxation and employment flexibility. So how, how are we further evolving to, to nurture the future of finance and support innovation and sustainability? So our laws and regulations as I've mentioned, were an innovation uh, at the time, in 2004. In 2017, we saw the potential for technology to transform financial services and indeed the wider economy. So as part of the wider UAE initiative to harness the fourth industrial revolution, we launched our future of finance strategy with the aim of building an innovation ecosystem to support fintech firms and other technologies to access funding, talent and market opportunities with low barriers to entry in terms of costs and resourcing. So as part of that, we launched the region's first accelerator program. The DFSA, our regulator, introduced its innovation testing license, a regulatory sandbox, if you will. And our innovation hub now houses over 500 technology firms, uh, the largest cluster in the GCC and wider region. It's a mix of startups, scale ups and unicorns, and it's across the fintech verticals, but also the enabling technologies such as cyber, digital ID and blockchain. That innovation hub is embedded in the wider DIFC ecosystem, providing access to knowledge and expertise of financial firms, lawyers, consultancies, access to public and private capital, uh, partner firms, you know, for example, sit in our accelerator program as investors and mentors. We have 25 or so VC venture capital companies based in the IFC and the government of Dubai has set up a $300 million uh, future district fund and a $100 million uh, venture, uh, venture debt fund, uh, both of which are housed uh, in the DIFC. And indeed, um, fintech firms in the DIFC have raised over $300 million in funding from uh, regional and international investors. We continue to evolve the offering, right? So we're looking at a venture building uh, studio model to support innovation in, in particular segments. And our regulator, the DFSA, continues to evolve the regulatory regime to reflect new and emerging business models because we see we see regulation as an, an enabler uh, providing certainty and safeguards required by a market participant and users and investors alike. So recently the DFSA has introduced a comprehensive regime for digital payments, venture capital, investment and crypto tokens. Now, just a few words on, on sustainability. 
Uh, we have a number of initiatives that were uh, underway uh, linked to promoting sustainable finance through collaboration. Uh, our membership of the MENA FinTech Sustainable Alliance is one example of that. The alliance, which is open to all MENA-based FinTechs, brings together regional and international financial centre bodies and associations and FinTech players with two aims, really, to make knowledge and expertise available to FinTech firms so that they can become more aware of the issues and can build sustainable finance into their business models uh, and set up internal mechanisms to track progress. And secondly, to act as a forum in which policymakers and FinTech firms can interact can match the wider needs uh, of the economy to possible solutions driven by tech. I think it's undeniable that technology will play a significant role if society's sustainable goals are to be met. As I mentioned, that's one initiative. We also have, we, all, we are also members of the wider Dubai Sustainable Finance Working Group, looking to embed sustainable best practice in capital markets, uh, addressing issuers and investors alike. And our regulator, the DFSA, has launched a task, task force on sustainable finance to make sure that global regulatory best practice uh, is, is applied um, in, in that area as well. Ultimately, our standing as a leading global financial hub means we are in a position uh, to bring the, about the change uh, that's needed in the region. ESG initiatives uh, are a component of our future of finance growth strategy, and really this continues the IFC's track record as an agent for change. Now, just turning specifically as to how uh, we involve the, the private and public sectors uh, to drive business growth for our firms and innovation um, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the community. I mean, the real benefit of a financial centre is its ability to provide a focal point for activities which add to the economy and support wider economic growth, right? So once you've created an ecosystem, you get an agency effect. So, for example, with the DIFC, you know, our deep financial services ecosystem of 800 and so regulated entities, the professional services firms, the corporates, the intermediaries, the innovation companies. In effect, we have over 32,000 people actively sourcing, engaging, transacting uh, investments and investment opportunities, actually generating two-way investment flows in and out of the region. And public and private capital is drawn to that, drawn to that act activity drawn to that clustered expertise. Secondly, um, it's a ideal platform for investors, right? So DIFC's infrastructure of laws and regs and expertise that's in place provides an ideal platform for investors to structure their investments, uh, to arrange their investments, to hold uh, investments. And indeed, we have a, a whole range of structures uh, which are utilized by corporates, institutions and private investors uh, across different economic sectors, yeah, financial services and, and wealth management, but also construction, logistics, education, healthcare and technology. And for private investors, of course, you know, DIFC again leverages the attractions of the city of Dubai uh, as one that's conducive to attracting uh, individuals, entrepreneurs, families, um, you know, both regionally and internationally. And then some final remarks, uh, just leave you with some pointers for budding financial centres in Eurasia. I think firstly, um, you need to have a clear vision. There needs to be a, 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 uh, a explicit market proposition. So, you know, what is that opportunity for investors and mar financial market participants? You know, the financial market participants are key conduits for attracting economic activity and investment flows. Secondly, that adherence to international standards. I mean, you could weave together the existing uh, with new frameworks, you know, to provide that cohesive environment. I mean, it's quite easy to set up new laws and, and ecosystems, but it takes commitment and persistence to deliver. 
then you combine that with the business friendly incentives around taxation, around uh, attracting talent, um, just to facilitate the ease and, and drop and go of business models from elsewhere, you know, into your particular uh, environment. And think about those, uh, you know, the wider economic sectors to support inward movement of talent and capital, you know, education, healthcare, leisure, connectivity, all of it very important. A financial center cannot operate in isolation. And then finally, you know, look to overcome existing interests which may uh, display uh, initial resistance at least. I mean, the pie will grow for everyone. Um, and the change may be gradual and incremental for sure. OK, I will leave it there. Uh, thank you for your time and I wish you an insightful and productive forum. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, next uh, there will be a panel discussion and uh, let me introduce the members of the panel discussion. And I'm sure you will agree with me that uh, how great is such a forum that individually these panel members represent vast experience in the financial sector, but combined together, I think uh, it creates such an opportunity to bring out something more even. So first, uh, the first panel member is uh, Mr. Kushimov, Chief Executive Officer of the Astana Financial Services Authority. Mr. Kushimov has extensive experience in senior positions in the area of financial market regulation. Prior to his appointment to the CEO of the Astana FSA, uh, he served as a, the executive body member in charge of fintech regulation and company registration of the AFSA. And previously, he also worked for a stock exchange, the Astana International Exchange. And he also holds the LLM degree from the University of Cambridge Faculty of Law. So, Mr. Kushiro, please join me at the stage. <laughs> Professor Michael Manielli, uh, Executive Chairman of ZN Group. Michael is a qualified accountant, a securities professional, a computer specialist, and a management consultant educated at the Harvard University and the Trinity College Dublin, with his PhD from the London School of Economics. He is the co-founder co of the ZN Group, the leading think tank of the City of London. He is also an author of a book, The Price of Fish, a new approach to wicked economics and better decision, and this book won the Independent Publishers Book Award Finance, Investment and Economic World Prize. And he's also the alderman of the City of London. Please, Michael, join us in the set stage. <laughs> Mr. Yang Su Park is Director of Economic Research Institute at the Bank of Korea. And uh, prior to his posi this position, he led the Economic Statistics Department as a Director General uh, at the bank. And he joined the Bank of Korea in 1991 and worked most of his career as head of and senior re economist at the Research Department and Financial Stability Department. He wrote two books, Economic Forecast in Practice and Theoretical Economics for the Capital in the 21st Century. He received his PhD in economics at the University of Illinois. Please, Mr. Park. <laughs> professor Chun Chien is ex executive dean and professor at the Fanhai International School of Finance at the Fudan University. Before returning to China in 2013, he was a tenured financial professor, professor at the Carroll School of Management, Boston College. His research papers have been published in top academic journals, including Journal of Finance, Review of Financial Studies, and the Journal of Financial Economics and Management Sciences. He recently published a book entitled The Power of China's Financial System. And he is also have a relation to the stock exchange world, 
He is a member of the academic committee of the Capital Market Research Institute of the Shanghai Stock Exchange. Please, uh, Professor, join us at the stage. So I think uh, you all agree that uh, Mr. Ali Hassan's uh, keynote was an excellent uh, sum up what financial hubs, financial centers are about and uh, what, what uh, benefits uh, they can bring to the economy, real economy and, and people's life. And also he mentioned a lot of important factors that uh, help them to really reach a very, very successful development of a financial hub in Dubai. So maybe we can continue on, on a general level after this keynote presentation. And uh, my first question to everybody, all of you, is uh, really about that. What do you think, what's the main uh, financial centers had something special and what are the most important success factor for a financial sector development and what really we can learn about them. So first, Mr. Kushimov. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would first like to use this opportunity to thank uh, Central uh, Bank of Hungary for your hospitality and for arranging this, such a uh, great event. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be uh, here today and to represent my country. Uh, I think kind of it was clearly said uh, in the f by the first speaker that uh, size of the economy uh, matters a lot in building up uh, financial centers. So for major financial centers that we have today, while it's uh, not an easy task to um, keep uh, these leading roles, it was a kind of straightforward task to build uh, their financial industry on the top of existing uh, economic economy of their respective countries. I think for us it's uh, a bit different task uh, and, um, and I think for me as a regulator we need clearly understand our strengths and our competitive advantages and leverage them to build uh, a different financial centers with different uh, perspectives and um, attract uh, people which will be attracted by such advantages. And just there are maybe many of them, but being here in Budapest today, I would like to kind of mention two of them. First, it's international and regional cooperation. And I think two countries and two cities are very well placed to harness our uh, unique location and unique position. For Budapest being a member of European Union and uh, with uh, great historic roots with Asia gives a very kind of unique uh, opportunity as well for Astana. So being a member of wider Eurasia region, Eurasian Economic Union with very close links with neighboring Central Asian, Caucasian and other countries, but also having a uh, new financial infrastructure built in our region and in our country also plays us in a unique position to foster uh, building the financial center. And I want to use this opportunity also to, you know, to um, you know, focus on that point that building this international regional cooperation is one of the uh, main parts of bringing up these uh, successful financial centers. Secondly, also was mentioned by previous speakers, this is technology. And I think uh, technology could provide us with the opportunity to leapfrog what other financial centers already achieved. And I think we clearly need to seize this opportunity and as a regulator be able to understand and uh, to be a very real enablers uh, 
for for businesses to harness what the business what the new technologies could bring for them and for our respective countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your answer. Mr. Marinelli, can you continue? Well, Richard, uh, thank you very much, and it is a real delight to be here and talk about a subject that's dear to my heart. Um, I think both uh, Mr. Hassan and you, Richard, uh, both mentioned the importance of uh, connecting to the real economy. We often focus on capital, but I, I believe it really begins with trade. There's no surprise there that railways and ports are the places that become financial centers uh, over time. Um, I could regale you with statistics because we compile the Global Financial Centers Index. We look at 151 variables. We cover 129 centers. Uh, but people often say at the end of an hour with me, or sometimes even at the end of 10 minutes, uh, could you get to the point? <laughs> you know, what is the most important element? And I would argue that the most important element is to treat all comers fairly. If you look back uh, at London in 1982 when the Big Bang legislation was announced and Big Bang came out in 1986, the Japanese were mystified in the late 80s at why London had been successful. They've just opened themselves up. They've allowed their native businesses to be purchased. What's going on here? Why are they doing so well? Mm -hmm. And they coined a term, the Wimbledon effect. And the Wimbledon effect was basically that whilst uh, London could host the great tennis championship, it was unlikely to ever have a winner. <laughs> Uh, we'll leave Andy Murray to one side, um, but it was unlikely to have a winner, but it would still make money out of running the event, selling the strawberries, handling the, handling the referee. And this treating all comers fairly to me is really the, probably the most important single element after you cut through the macroeconomics and the local economics. And I think there's a little test for that. And the test is, do people conduct business in your financial center when there is no local component? So I have seen many deals occur in Beijing or New York or Tokyo, but there's always been a Chinese, you know, an American or a Japanese component to it. Uh, so it's not uncommon, though, in particularly in London or I would say in Singapore, to see businesses conducting deals with each other and having no native domestic interest or presence. I see that happening a little bit, uh, to be honest, in, in Astana, very much in Seoul and even in Busan. Uh, in Korea, and I think that to me would be the test because if people are doing that, then you are local everywhere. Thank you very much. Mr. Park, can you continue? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Sir, and uh, it's really honor to be here, and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, let me focus on a little bit uh, Korean experience. Uh, as it, uh, our uh, speaker and uh, panel discussant mentioned there are lots of factors to be a global financial center. In Korea, just Korea initiated a plan to turn into be a Northeast Asian financial hub in 2003. And then first basic plan uh, in which Seoul and Busan was designated as the financial center was established in 2008. And then it has been upgraded from time to time, the latest one was in 2020. Uh, Korea has been implementing uh, financial center policy steadily, thanks to those efforts. Korea's environment as a financial center has improved quite a lot, based on GFCI by GN Group. Yeah, Seoul ranked 41st in 2006 and jumped to 6th in 2016. Now, as of 2020, is ranking around 20. So, ranking is volatile, but we can interpret Korea's attractiveness as a final center remain a little bit stagnant, right? So, as time, time goes on, the ranking might be changed, uh, but stagnant ranking of Seoul makes our policymakers a little bit alert, right? So, uh, Okay, recent research and some expert, even you mentioned that culture is just very important, one of the important factors, K-pop or K-stars, it helps to just like make our Seoul or Busan or the World Finance Center. But many uh, researchers and experts uh, identify some negative attributes, such as Korea financial authorities' inflexibility, excess regulation or lack of tax incentive, even language barriers and difficulty in mm -hmm. children's education kind of thing. 
Therefore, Korea government keep trying to correct this type of identified needs. Also, we are trying to strengthen advantage in IT infrastructure, fintech technology business, and demand for asset management services. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Professor, please. Uh, first of all, great to be here uh, in person. Uh, so I, I would like to summarize. To be a financial center, um, you run the exchange. So you need companies. You need companies to be listed on exchanges. Of course, you need money. Uh, you need wealth. Um, without money, you cannot do wealth management. You need people. You need, you need to finance professionals. I train uh, students to be uh, bankers and so forth. You need technology, and you also need a very good regulatory environment. I, I want to say that um, if you look at the financial centers of the world, maybe there are two types or two phases of development. Um, take the example of London. Uh, even though the size of the U UK economy is no longer the largest, but at one time it was the largest. Uh, take the example of China. I think if you take the example of Shanghai and to some extent Hong Kong, uh, up to this point, uh, Shanghai becoming a, at least a, a, a national and global international global financial center, it benefits greatly that it's backed by the Chinese economy. So for Shanghai, there are many, many companies to be chosen to be listed. For Shanghai, if you, if you want to do wealth management, um, you know, if you look at the stats on the number of billionaires, uh, it's going, going up very quickly. So, so I think that's the advantage of uh, a financial center like Shanghai because it can draw within China. But on the other hand, if you really want to be a truly international financial center, uh, Singapore is a very good example, London. So I agree wholeheartedly with uh, uh, Mr. Manelli said, you, are, you have to be able to attract uh, global companies to go to your exchange rather than other exchanges. You have to be able to attract people, uh, especially people with a lot of wealth, so that they want to spend, they want to do their wealth management uh, in one particular center than the others. So in that regard, I think the business environment uh, is very, very important. Yeah, I think from this first round, uh, we, we already see that it is a very, very complex system and it's a complex ecosystem that should work with, with all the elements uh, that you mentioned during this first uh, question. So, let us focus now on uh, some of the particulars of this complex ecosystem. So, Mr. Kushimov, you have a personal experience in uh, regulating fintechs. So, technology is key to today's financial system. Fintechs are uh, disrupting some of the services, sometimes helping the incumbents, sometimes disrupting it. So, what is your experience, uh, how regulation Prudential regulation can help uh, facilitate the activities of fintech companies. Yep, thank you very much for your question. Um, I think, kind of, as a regulator, first of all, uh, we need to kind of find where our mindset is about these new technologies, because this is the very uh, necessary prerequisite uh, for developing the regulation uh, further. So we asked ourselves at the very beginning where we created our financial center, do we want to regulate or do we want just to prohibit such new technologies that it was at that time and probably still is too very difficult to understand for an average person? Do we want to kind of lead this innovation or we want to be led by what is going around the world and thirdly do we want to listen uh, entrepreneurs and innovators or do we want to stay deaf to them so my answer to all three of these was yes and therefore it prompted a second step uh, to create uh, an infrastructure in terms both regulations, 
human capital. So regulate is very big part of this infrastructure because without having the knowledge and without having a human capital inside re financial regulator, it's very difficult to build an environment which is uh, favorable to fintech firms. So you know, I think state and the regulators have a very important role in building uh, fintech uh, favorable environment. And why kind of we need this? I think one example uh, highlights the the importance of of fi financial technologies. Uh, I've been to one of the conference, and one example which kind of struck me that if we remember 30 years ago in the beginning of 90s, late 80s. Uh, the settlement cycle on on in the capital market uh, was T plus five, and it was okay. <laughs> it took us around 30 years to make it T plus two, so one minus one day in decade, roughly. Uh, today, these new technologies, blockchain, could bring us T plus instant zero, and that technology exists and and it kind of new opportunities for business for everyone but also kind of put a lot of pressure on regulators how to deal with that and i think we need to be open minded and understand the technologies understand all the risk and find the right way to regulate them so that it could coexist thank you Thank you much. Michael, as you mentioned, uh, you are calculating some of the leading indices in terms of uh, financial centers, green finance, and smart cities, and so on. So how do you see the role of technology, whether a center goes up or down in, in your rankings and, uh, and in terms of how successfully a center is adapting to the changes of technology? Yeah. Uh, the word ecosystem has been used a few times here, and I, and I think it's a very good word, um, but it implies a system that's so complex we can't understand it, uh, very much like uh, Georgie's opening remarks today. Uh, it's a very complex environment mm -hmm. through which we can, from which we can only pull a few generalized laws. Um, I, I would dwell on the fact that, one, competition is crucial to technology, full stop. It, it, it is the most important thing. And yet, financial services needs to be regulated, uh, particularly for consumer protection, and I'll come to that in a second. Therefore, the regulatory competitive balance is one of the most important factors. Uh, we, we look at things in the financial centers index with the business environment, general financial sector development, human capital, short and long, infrastructure, and the kind of general reputation is a nice place to live. But this competitive regulatory balance is one that each center sets differently. And it can set it differently for different markets. Uh, I often think, bluntly, that the UK is terrible at retail. We have got, I think, the second worst rated retail experience in financial services in the OECD. But why are we such a great center? It's wholesales where we compete. We are, you know, we are the preeminent wholesale area. And where do you see that? Well, the funny bit is you don't. We have 525,000 people working in the square mile. About 200,000 of those are in financial services. There are 24,000 firms in that square mile. So you're working out the average there, which is 20. Actually, that's even split. 250,000 work for 250 firms, and the rest work for these small firms, really, more an average of about 10. So it's that huge bifurcation and these systems working together, people innovating constantly at that level, that I don't think the regulators can handle. It's just not something you do. I, I used to manage Ministry of Defense research, we invented virtually nothing. It all came from the smaller suppliers we were working with. That's, that's where the innovation comes from. And I'm seeing it in this area also, uh, for me, the, the real explosion is going to come in areas like professional services exports, where we're already beginning to see a, a diffusion there. We're beginning to see difficulties in defining what is a national financial services firm. Far more difficult to define a local financial center. It's causing our firm great troubles. What is a commercial center if people are only coming in three days a week on average 
uh, people are working from several hundred miles away or across national borders. So I think this explosion, uh, particularly in the wholesale markets, is one that regulators probably ought to back off on. And the area that regulators probably ought to move forward on is much tighter controls on, on the retail. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. So, Mr. Park, uh, the next question is about financial stability. So whether it can be an important factor in terms of competitiveness of, of an economy and also a financial center. And uh, as Bank of Korea, I guess, is also responsible for financial stability in Korea, what, what are your experiences around that? Yeah. You know that uh, we don't really miss the when it just like figured out that was the main factor for as a, a global financial center. One of them is a financial stability kind of thing. Right? So uh, in order to be a financial center, stability of financial market and institutions is very important. And some central, generally the central bank is a body of a lender of large leisure and is responsible for making finance stable and function well. That's why we monitor the supervised financial sector with response to financial stability in addition to monetary policy. In order to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic, Bank of Korea and our government take effective uh, contag contingent measures and aggressive monetary and fiscal policy. But there were unintended consequent or side effect. Those were financial imbalances and high inflation. So last year, Bank of Korea raised the, our base rate uh, from 0.5% to 2.5% between August 2021 and August 2022. Last year, our policy mainly focusing on more like on addressing accumulation of household debt. This year, we emphasize tackling high inflation at this moment. In fact, early move in raising policy rate uh, turns out to be right choice to help lessening inflation pressure compared to other countries like the US. At this moment, we evaluate Korea's financial system has remained stable overall. However, the buildup in the household debt level is potential major vulnerability, and the raising interest rate will give a big burden to big household debtor. So, uh, also recently domestic and overseas risk factors are increasingly likely to be negatively affect to our financial stability. Therefore, uh, preventing any accumulation of financial imbalances and working on enhancing vigilance of financial institutions are our top priority in our policy. Thank you very much. Professor Qian, uh, China is one of the leading uh, country in the world in terms of uh, technology, also in finance. You have uh, the second largest number of, of unicorns in, in the field of, of fintechs. So what do you think, what were the steps that, that uh, made these uh, fantastic results possible? So that's a great question. So I'll, I'll, I'd like to take the example of uh, one branch of fintech that is uh, payment system. Right? So uh, as you know, uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, China was very much lagging behind. Uh, we didn't even have a lot of credit card users. Uh, at the same time, there was huge demand from individuals and from uh, micro businesses. Um, they, they want convenience, they want low fees. Uh, so so I, I guess one important factor for this is demand driven. And second thing is that you need entrepreneurs uh, to be creative, uh, and here we come uh, in China and in the world, we, we, we know we have two horses, right? The, 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 the Alipay and the Tencent Pay. Mm -hmm. So what they figure out ways to do is what they do is they, 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 they establish this so-called third party system. What they do is they facilitate a payment, especially a small payment between an individual and an institution, a bank. Uh, this is called the third party payment system. Uh, 
uh, and uh, actually there are more companies than those two, but those two are, uh, are, are obviously very dominant in sort of the consumer payment system. As uh, Michael mentioned, competition is very important. In this type of business, as long as you have two dominant players, I think there's actually enough competition. So you, you can look at all the fees uh, within China, especially for consumers, the fees are very low. I mean, I, I, I stayed in, we, we both spent a lot of time in the US. The bank credit card fees are, are, are quite high for a number of reasons. The other factor that's very important, uh, we talked about regulatory env uh, environment. The, the central bank, uh, the governor was uh, Governor uh, Zhou Xiaochuan. Uh, in, in a lot of people's view, in my view, he's, he's one of the greatest uh, central bankers in China. His attitude and the central bank attitude at that time was to give them a chance. Give, them, give these individual entrepreneurs a chance and see how, how, how quick they can grow. And even when they grow very fast, uh, there weren't a lot of restrictions for them to grow until uh, these companies become so dominant and the fact that they possess a lot of important data, uh, data on consumer uh, um, spending and so forth. So obviously in recent years, China also rolled out these uh, uh, data issues, data privacy issues uh, to regulate them. Uh, so, so to summarize this sort of success story, uh, I think uh, financial institution and entrepreneurs need to meet the demand of the population. Uh, they need to try new things and the regulators uh, need to accommodate uh, innovative behavior until at some point, if these companies become a very big part of the financial infrastructure, clearly you need to regulate them. Sure. So back to Michael's point, it's a balance, right? It's Absolutely. A competition and entrepreneurship and, and regulation. Absolutely. Mr. Kushim, have you already mentioned digital assets and blockchain as, as, as a new technology? Not so new, maybe we are talking about, about it uh, several years. So f as a regulator, what kind of opportunities and risks do you see in different application of, of uh, blockchain technology and digital assets? Yep. I think, you know, for me personally, and, and I have kind of, I agree with uh, previous speakers um, that, you know, this is a great technologies which provide us with opportunity to leapfrog. But you know, we need to, to have a very delicate balance in the exercise. First, on one hand, uh, we need to force the competition. Otherwise, if there is no competition, I'm 100% I, I sure there will be no innovation. So competition is a prerequisite for any innovations and kind of as a country, as a regulator, we want to have innovations happen uh, in our country. So, and if we do want this, we need to be very open-minded to these new technologies. I understand that uh, blockchain technology is very different to crypto assets and um, digital assets. I'm 100% sure that as a technology, it will stay with us for the longer future. Uh, with this kind of um, new type of assets as a digital assets, uh, while they are very volatile and do possess a lot of risk to you and consumers, um, it's still kind of, I think, that needs to have an attitude to give them a chance to, to develop something first. So I think kind of we took this approach and we allowed to, uh, to operate digital assets, trading facility, VASPs and intermediaries in a highly regulated environment. So kind of on one hand, we want to protect consumers. We want to regulate, especially the risky sides of this technology like IML, client ad identification, P2P transactions. So we, we don't want that happen. Uh, any breaches of or any kind of wrongdoing happens with using such technologies. 
So we try to be risk aversive here, but on the other hand, we want them to try these new technologies. We want entrepreneurs to come under our regulations and then build something. So this is our approach. This is a very delicate, I would say, balancing exercise. Uh, but I think that kind of something that could could help us achieve what we want, and we want to achieve a very successful financial center. Can I Thank you. add some yes. comment related to that? Uh, let me address that issue with respect to central bank digital currency mm -hmm. issuance kind of thing. Uh, as you just discussed about government regulation must strike a balance between promoting innovation and effective competition while protecting investors and consumers. A ripple effect of developing fintech or blockchain technology would be profound, as you know. But acceleration of expanding big tech with stable coins in the payment sector might do harm. Right? So uh, this is one of the reasons central banks are preparing central banking uh, cent digital currency we are preparing the, uh, that innovation in CBDCs also are expected to catalyze the promotion of capital market. When he introduced the cross-border payment system, CBDC provides another opportunity for promoting regional capital market development and strengthening regional fiscal safety net kind of thing, financial mm -hmm. safety net. Thank you. I think this is a very interesting topic. So, Michael, I know that you already also have a huge experience in blockchain technology and, and, and the like. So do you want to add something maybe to this topic? Well, yes. Um, I mean, blockchain is much older than most people in banking know. We built our first blockchain in 1995, and we weren't the first. Uh, in fact, I've written a paper on the origins which show that it's been around. The consensus mechanisms of cryptocurrencies, though, were new in 2009. So that's a... That's a distinction, but it's interesting, of course. CBDCs are not going to use a consensus mechanism. It's irrelevant to them. And frankly, they probably won't use a blockchain. Why would you have an external ledger that might disagree with your internal ledger? What's mm -hmm. the point? I'm the central bank, I'm gonna be right. I think as we look ahead, we've got some big issues here. Uh, probably the biggest one is what happens to fractional reserve banking. Mm -hmm. That's probably one. And I think the other issue we haven't really discussed as a global society, because I think people see it as a national discussion is the role of privacy. You know, you've got two choices here. You have anonymous CBDCs or you've got the central bank sees everything. And I think you've got, a, a, again, a big distinction here as to whether or not you do or don't retain commercial banks in that process or if you go direct to consumer. Thank you. Professor, do you want to add something? Sure, sure. Um, so obviously this is a very interesting area of research. Uh, my colleagues and I are working on this. Uh, so I this is my own my, uh, my own view. Uh, going forward, I think you're going to see a sort of a two-tier system in terms of cur um, uh, digital currencies. Uh, at the top, it will be the CBDCs. It will be the digital currencies issued by all the major economies um, because uh, they're backed by central banks. Um, but on the other hand, uh, cryptocurrencies, I don't think they're going to go away. I mean, if you look at uh, price movement of uh, Bitcoin, it's still traded at 20,000, that's very high. Uh, and despite all the technological uh, issues, the, the idea of, of these cryptocurrencies is because there is still a, uh, enormous demand for, um, um, for, 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 for trading and wealth transactions anonymously. Uh, and cryptocurrencies uh, do that. Even if the CBDCs can also do anonymous transactions, but that's why I think the, the, the cryptocurrencies will still be there. In terms of the experience of China, uh, we know that uh, the digital RMB has been uh, promoted, has been used up to this point, mostly in domestic consumption. The idea is basically replacing some of the cash, it's M0. Um, but going forward, uh, I know that the central uh, the, the PB, PBOC is very cautious, but as an as a academic, I can stipulate. Um, I, it would be really interesting to see how CBDCs can be used in cross-border transactions. Uh, I actually agree with Mr. Park. If, if, obviously very important, if there is enough coordination among central banks, 
where's the CBDCs used in uh, uh, cross-border transactions? I think it will actually not only increase the speed and efficiency, uh, it actually can increase safety for, for the global uh, system. Right. Yes, yeah, I just, you know, a couple of very interesting thoughts that I also would like to add uh, to Mr. Huang's uh, comments. I think first one is that, you know, clearly uh, there is a sentiment that these cryptocurrencies will not go away. Uh, we don't know for sure, but uh, my view that technology will definitely stay with us. Uh, probably the shape and format of uh, cryptocurrencies, whether it will be Bitcoin or Fear or something el else, but kind of there will be something of this type of assets. Uh, and and the secondly, because you know, there is also demand for anonymity and uh, kind of using this uh, type of assets for uh, illegal transactions or for hiding some of transactions. It is kind of very important, and I'm bringing kind of you to my very first uh, point that it's very necessary for a regulator to have enough human and technological capacity to actually address these issues. First of all, you need to have people who actually kind of take enough to, to see this risk and issues and work together with the industry and then speak their language. And secondly, to embrace the kind of also new technologies which helps regulators to look at these risks, to analyze them properly. And then a couple of years ago for kind of when I speak with regulators all kind of around the globe and then the topic of KYT, know your transaction or blockchain analytics wasn't there. So we, we didn't discuss it. If we speak today, that will be one of the topics uh, we would discuss with, uh, with uh, our peers that which type of KYT system do you use? What the benefits of this and that system? Uh, do you have any examples where it help you to find the list of transactions or to kind of uh, engage one of the customers which try to make anonymous transactions? So that's now part of regulatory day-to-day -day operation, which is was not here just couple of years ago and and I think this is a very important part of uh, for any regulator if they want to you kind know, of force the innovations regulator itself need to be very innovative inside thank you very much definitely it's a hot topic so maybe to the last round of questions uh, I, I will raise two topics simultaneously. One is SME and uh, SME financing through capital markets and financial instruments. And the second one is uh, if I can ask an advice from you, how Budapest should uh, develop further its status as a regional uh, financial center. So, Ms. Park, if you can start, because Korea has an uh, extensive experience in SME financing and helping them to, to come to capital markets. Okay. Uh, as you all might know, the Korea's SME is a significant, significant share of domestic economy, uh, especially is 84% among all enterprises in Korea. Uh, when we compare it the United States, 73, Japan, 63, German, 80%. Even SMEs plays a crucial role in the economy, covering lion's share of the employment, and their access to capital market as limited. That is due to the well-known problem of information asymmetry. In fact, SMEs in Korea received heavily won bank lending to finance their operation around 80%, resulting in the lack of credit supply for many of those without any collateral kind of thing. Over the past several years, uh, Korean government continued to address that issue, this imbalance by boosting SME's financing in capital market. Uh, we create the Korean new exchange that is called Connex, 
in 2013 uh, to exclusively facilitate the early stage of SMEs to start uh, startups to raise funds. As earlier, the number of listed companies in Connect uh, market capital has increased significantly. So, and also we have some uh, credit guarantee program. Korea government has those kind of operate uh, credit guarantee programs for small business to issue corporate bond and uh, CPs, etc. Yeah, let me mm -hmm. stop here and move on to the rapid thing. Yeah. yeah, I know just like one of my colleagues they recommended when I went there, then what you can recommend to the Budapest or uh, Central Bank of Hungary. Uh, they suggest that the benchmarking specific case might not the best strategy for being a uh, successful financial hub. Uh, actually, in Korea, all people that even successful financial hubs or financial center uh, is own history, like London or New York has their own. Especially in Korea, 1970s, 80s, banks were guided by the government to help manufacturing sector more like depending on the government-led growth strategy, right? But the uh, leading, just like what's said, development in other financial hubs, New York or London, was not driven by enterprise or government, but by themselves as a financial service provider kind of thing. So Budapest could consider those kind of focused approach that fit its case. Thank you very so, much. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Kushima. Yep. Uh, in terms of uh, your question on SMEs financing, I think kind of uh, our kind of regulatory approach, first of all, kind of similar to many other countries in terms of current situation with inflation, high inflation, and other two is the kind of uh, the requirement to have bigger pool of, of financing uh, available for small and medium firms, but on the other hand, we also try to leverage uh, this new type of uh, fintech um, firms like crowdfunding uh, payment solutions to first lower down the cost of operation for them and also the cost of, uh, of funding. This is, I think, one of the approach uh, regulator could, could force that. Uh, in terms of the kind of Budapest, uh, what I would like to suggest, this is something that I would like to suggest to myself and, and, and I would like to share it with you, which I already mentioned. Now, being here today uh, and, and arriving yesterday, I saw that the mixture of, even in architecture, is the mixture of European and Asian style. We do share a lot of history and, and, and speaking with the people, kind of, you on one hand, very deeply rooted in European culture, being part of Europe, but also having a very deep historical links with, with Asia, I think places you in a very unique kind of position to be a hub between two cultures, two financial systems, and be on this part of the Silk Road route. And, and I think kind of for us, it definitely is something we need to clearly see uh, that one of the kind of potential ways to establish financial hub, uh, financial services hub, uh, is to support and foster regional, regional and global cooperation and to use the access to our markets from a prospective player. So that's one of kind of ways to develop a financial hub. Second, I think we need clearly understand what are our competitive advantages, what are our strengths. They are very different to other financial centers because most of them have a very big local context, either they're baked by big size economy or governmental programs or trade routes which were historical there. We have a different uh, setup, which is very local, uh, but we need to understand what are these strengths and advantages which we already have 
uh, and leverage them to the benefit of creating a sustainable financial hub here Thank as well. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Professor Chien, uh, considering the time, very short answer, please. Sure. On the first question, SME, the Chinese experienced two things. One is before IPO, uh, as I already said, there are these platforms, uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay. They have a lot of payment and consumption data of, of all the consumers. Some of them are entrepreneurs. So the key is, as mentioned, uh, uh, banks are not willing to lend to SMEs because they don't have a lot of collateral. These platforms, because they have the payment data, they can access, they can assess uh, SMEs' risk and give them loans without collateral. The other example, uh, the other thing is that the Shanghai Exchange established this star board uh, for technology startups, and they use a registration system which is very similar to New York, NASDAQ, and, and London. And very, very quickly for uh, Budapest, um, um, you know, I, 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 we live in a world at the times is very uncertain. Uh, I already mentioned, for, to be a financial hub, you, are able, you need to be able to attract money, companies, and talent. Uh, so I actually think Budapest is in a very unique position uh, to attract uh, companies. I know that this Chinese company, Ningde Shidai, one of the biggest batteries producers. They, they already signed a mm -hmm. huge investment. And on my plane here, the, the gentleman sat, sat next to me, He's also wisdom, and he's going to do uh, R and D um, with batteries uh, in Hungary. So, if that continues, in a world where, you know, uh, or we mentioned that when 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 a lot of cities and countries mit were forced to take sides, if you can attract companies from all over the world to be here, I think you will see a lot of success. Thank you very much for the positive words. And final, Michael, please. I'll try and be quick. The I think one of the things I, I'd like to emphasize is uh, Tim O'Neill, uh, a U.S. Uh, politician from Massachusetts, once said, all politics is local. And I think all SME development is local. There are always peculiar local circumstances. Extrapolating, though, perhaps across Europe, we in London see ourselves as an SME engine. That's why I have those figures. For us, the most important thing is generating SMEs, not financial SMEs, just SMEs in general. Remember, all the major names you see in Canary Wharf and in the city were not there 36 years ago. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, they were not in London, believe it or not. So it, it, it matters. Those were our small businesses 36 years back. When you do look at SMEs across Europe, one of the interesting problems is credit. I can actually go out and gamble my entire mortgage, but I can't invest in my neighbor a few thousand pounds. And in fact, if he or she tells me that they're working on a business I might be able to invest in, in certain circumstances, they can get fined which sounds a bit perverse when I can go out and bet everything. I think what SMEs really have across the world and across Europe and related to, it's actually more of a credit issue. If you look at the balance sheets of the larger global firms, sort of 50-50 debt, as you move down, it becomes more and more equity or credit card equity uh, in many cases, so false debt where they're lying about what they've actually got the credit cards for. When it comes to Budapest, well, obviously the first thing is develop SMEs. I think the second thing is, as you're doing here with this, uh, and it was mentioned uh, in the, by Ali, develop a hub. You are developing a hub. Uh, this event is all about that. Um, I have had a look at your numbers. A little weak in Latin America, a little weak in Africa, but very strong in Asia and Europe, so that's superb. Develop a green finance option that's distinctive, not yet another green bond. I would point you, I think Astana has been promoting with others uh, a Eurasia Renewable Energy Internet. That's one option. Or look at what Chile did uh, just in March, where they issued a policy performance bond, which is linked to their 2030 carbon targets. Mm -hmm. The interest rate goes up if they fail to make the bond. Now, that's a, a new and novel thing that I think you could look at. And the final thing I'd close on is, uh, personally, when I was getting into finance in the 80s, we had a program in London, Capital City. And it was a great soap opera, uh, and Richard, needed to get some derivatives, some CDOs. I don't know what a CDO is, but he needed them, and if he got the derivatives before the end of the program, he got the girl in the car, and everything was okay. <laughs> Finance was exciting. <laughs> Finance today is very much a utility. Do you want to come and see my computers? You know, it's, it's really not sexy. 
The sexy bit is in the SMEs and these new businesses. It is going to be in the metaverse. And we in finance in the future, I think, have got to recognize we're going to be down there at that low level where the utilities that plug in and make these businesses happen. And that's a good role. It's a very useful role. But the idea that we are masters of the universe is long gone. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, gentlemen, I think it was very, very interesting. And thank you very much for a very valuable contribution. I hope the audience enjoyed it at least as much as I enjoyed it uh, moderating this panel. So please help me giving a hand to the panelists. Thank you, Mr. Vey, for guiding us through the first panel on such an important topic. And I also thank the participants for this viable discussion. Now, a short 10 minute break is coming up, but I encourage our online audience to stay close to the screens as our breaks feature excellent videos introducing our partners and initiatives of MMB. After the break, we'll come back to our next panel on geopolitics titled Globalization versus Regionalization. The changing value chains, connectivity and prosperity of Eurasia. Do stay with us for deeper insight into geopolitical activities. Ladies and gentlemen, please do keep in mind that the break has been shortened a little bit by a few minutes and will last only 10 minutes. Thank you. We see the opportunities, uh, we see the necessities uh, to launch a new creative uh, vehicle called uh, CBDC. The design features and safeguards around a CBDC, they do have to reflect best internationally prescribed standards, among others for financial stability, cyber resilience, and financial inclusion and access.
for researchers like myself who uh, look at the political economy of finance and financial technology, Shanghai is uh, definitely an important location and one that shouldn't be missed. Uh, so Fudan being in the, at the heart uh, of Shanghai, both at the academic and uh, market side uh, of finance, makes a big difference. Shanghai is uh, definitely a very good destination for foreigners to visit this country and to learn about China. It's been really great to meet so many people across the Fudan community, from undergraduates to graduates to postdoctoral scholars and professors. And I think the space here at FDI is wonderful to work at. I've been able to work at different coffee shops in front of the lawn around Guanghua Lowell in this building and it's just been a wealth of people, ideas and places here that I've been very grateful for. As a university academic, there's a danger that we would stay in a small circle of people who think the same way, that we live in the library. FDDI as a think tank was very useful for me to uh, meet people in the business sector, meet people in political sectors and I could bring their opinions into my research. The international environment for the job market is uh, very difficult uh, uh, and in fact the FDDI program provided me with that edge. What I liked about FDDI was that I, I had a chance to meet other experts of several areas and also the audience at my two presentations uh, was quite interactive, which I liked. For example, at my presentation about the, how the Belt and Road Initiative impacts the energy security of China, we discussed security issues involved. Uh, we have a very unique style of work here. It's very friendly, academic, highly recreational and uh, interchanging. For example, we go out and see places, uh, we share our experiences of life together, we take photographs, we take videos, and then we laugh. So at FDDI, there was a lot of freedom to work. We had good facilities. The staff was really, really helpful. I think if you really want to do any good visiting fellowship in China, uh, FDDI gives you the best. It's pretty clear that, uh, that China and Shanghai and Fudan University is a very, very, very dynamic place. I have uh, never experienced such a dynamic uh, institution. As, uh, as Fudan University, and that's also encouraging um, for me. China is um, a leading power in um, economy, but uh, becoming very soon, I guess, also a leading power in academic research and teaching. The program is an epitome of the diversity in Fudan. We have brilliant people from both academia and uh, industry, and we have achievements in both research and uh, practices. Diversity is always the key word here in FDDI, and that is why how we win top talents and inspire great ideas here. Connecting, Connecting people, people, sharing, sharing knowledge. knowledge. Connecting, Connecting people, sharing, sharing knowledge. knowledge. Connecting, Connecting people, people sharing, sharing knowledge. knowledge. OMFIF, the official monetary and financial institutions forum, is an independent think tank for central banking, economic policy and public investment. A neutral platform for best practice in worldwide public and private sector engages. With teams in London, Singapore and the US, OMFIF focuses on global policy and investment themes relating to central banks, sovereign funds, pension funds, regulators and treasuries. Global public investors with investable assets of $39.5 trillion are at the heart of our network. Membership offers insight through analysis and meetings. OMFIF analysis draws on expertise from our in-house specialists and a global network of public and private sector members. Many OMFIF meetings held under the OMFIF rules take place within central banks and other official institutions. Over the last year, we have hosted high-level speakers, including the chief economist of the ECB, 
Federal Reserve Bank Presidents, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, the President of the Deutsche Bundesbank, and the Chief Economist at GIC, Singapore's Sovereign Fund. To join us as a member or to find out more, email Chris Ostrowski, Chief Revenue Officer, on the address on the screen. Shanghai Forum 2021 is requested to accumulate the collective wisdom in this. UMFIF, the official monetary and financial institutions forum, is an independent think tank for central banking, economic policy and public investment. A neutral platform for best practice in worldwide public and private sector engages. With teams in London, Singapore and the US, UMFIF focuses on global policy and investment themes relating to central banks, sovereign funds, pension funds, regulators and treasuries. Global public investors with investable assets of $39.5 trillion are at the heart of our network. Membership offers insight through analysis and meetings. OMFIF analysis draws on expertise from our in-house specialists and a global network of public and private sector members. Many OMFIF meetings held under the OMFIF rules take place within central banks and other official institutions. Over the last year, we have hosted high-level speakers, including the Chief Economist of the ECB, Federal Reserve Bank Presidents, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, the President of the Deutsche Bundesbank, and the Chief Economist at GIC, Singapore's Sovereign Fund. To join us as a member or to find out more, email Chris Ostrowski, Chief Revenue Officer on the address on the screen. Planet Earth is our home and our most valued treasure. It is the responsibility of today's society to preserve it for generations to come. Humanity is continuously seeking ways to do more in this regard and hungry as well as MNB, must play its part in these efforts. According to an international survey, our country is currently the 19th amongst the European Union countries in terms of progress towards achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We still have much to accomplish in terms of clean energy, tackling climate change, and the protection of terrestrial ecosystems. In addition, relative to other European Union countries, 
our economy is more vulnerable to environmental issues. All this clearly shows that we must restructure our economy, in which MNB plays a key role by facilitating the financing of investments. We must support the adaptation of the economy and mitigate the consequences of climate change, as well as reduce the funding of activities harmful to the environment. To this end, in 2019, MNB established the Green Programme to support the domestic financial sector in measuring, managing and reducing the risks arising from climate change and other environmental degradation. We formulated new recommendations and regulations to reduce these risks, as well as to expand green finance. Furthermore, 2020 saw the introduction of an innovative preferential capital treatment for housing loans to enable commercial banks to provide favourable mortgage loans for energy efficient properties. several positions researching the field of international relations, arms control and China-US relations. He is one of the most cited Chinese authors around the globe and one of the top 100 public intellectuals according to Foreign Policy magazine. Globalization is undergoing radical changes. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the vulnerability of the value chains, a decisive element of the international relations and geopolitical strategies. The megacities and city clusters are emerging on the world stage as new political and economic power centers. One of the main questions is whether globalization or regionalization will be more influential in the next decades and which will better serve the competitiveness of the Eurasian nations. and China-US relations. He is one of the most cited Chinese authors around the globe and one of the top 100 public intellectuals according to Foreign Policy magazine.
Excuse us, ladies and gentlemen, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. So we're going to continue with our program and then come back to that video. So now it is time to move to the panel discussion. Therefore, let me invite Mr. Norbert Chismadia, the president of the Board of Trustees at the Palace Athene Domus Mariti Foundation, who will moderate the panel discussion dedicated to geopolitics. Mr. Chismadia is also a well-known geographer, geopolitical and geoeconomic thinker, and the author of several books. In his latest publication entitled Geofusion 2.0, Towards a Long-Term Sustainable Eurasian Growth, he interprets the global economic and geopolitical trends of the 21st century by exploring their geographical and economic context. His research results are substantiated by 100 new awareness-raising maps and charts. So, she's my dear. Mr. Chismadia, welcome. As a geographer and expert in economic strategy, regional and urban development, as well as geopolitics, I am sure that you are aware of the consequences that the changing world order implies on Central and Eastern European region. How is the region managing these challenges? Thank you for your question. Welcome to everybody. I try to answer it very shortly. So the three is answer. The first is geography, location, location, location. Because I think is uh, the Europe and even the Central and Eastern Europe, the Hungary is not the part of the Eastern part of the European Union, but is a main gateway region of the Western Eurasia in the connecting Eurasian region. The secondly, about the vision, strategy and action. Uh, it's very important for the political stability. It's very important that the monetary policy, geopolitics and economic policy work together. And even the Hungary was the first country the 11 years ago with the starting of the Eastern Opening Program and Hungary was the first European country is joining of the Belt and Road Initiative. And the first answer, because I think is Hungary to solve three plus one passwords. And the three passwords in the, of the 21st century are connectivity, complexity and sustainability. And the plus one, the age of Eurasia. So if the combinate the code, the code is getting for the result, we are living of the sustainable complexity, uh, sustainable connectivity in the complex Eurasian age. Okay, thank you. That was a very nice answer. I'm sure we'll hear very similar thought-provoking remarks from our distinguished guests. Mr. Chisma, the other floor is yours. Thank you very much. So to welcome our panel, the globalization versus regionalism, the changing value change, connectivity and prosperity of the age of Eurasia. I would like to warmly welcome and introduce our panelists. The first, Mr. Mehmet Hussein Bilgin, the chair of Euro-Asia Forum in politics, economics, business, and also founder, the vice president of Eurasia Business and Economic Society. Professor Bilgin has interesting research, research in the field of geopolitical risk affecting to the economy. Please welcome Mr. Mehmet Hussein Bilgin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to introduce Ms. Deborah Elms, the founder of Executive Director, Asian Trade Center, and President of Asia Business Trade Association. Elms the expensive the working with the trade policy in the region. So please welcome Deborah Elms. Deborah. Nice to I would like to join us by the online platform, Ms. Chen Ho Su, professor, the Dean of the School of International Relations and Public Affairs at the Fudan University. His major research interest are international relation theories, Chinese politics and foreign relations in the international organized. Please welcome in an online place in Chengdu Su, professor. And I would like to introduce Mr. Henry Tillman, the founder of the Grizzly Peak Service and China Investment Research. Mr. Tillman is over 35 years international banking experience and he's advised many Asian companies of the European cross-border methods. Please welcome Mr. Henry Tillman. Henry.
So I would like to open in question to Mr. Mehmet Bilgin. So the, being the professor of expert dealing economic policy, researching of apex or the global challenge such as COVID-19 pandemic. So how is the economic challenge and opportunities of Eurasian occur and geopolitical change affecting of the new first security model of the globalization? Thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, also, I would like to congratulate uh, Magnar Ramzeti Bank for organizing this uh, great uh, event. It is, you know, a well done job. Very great uh, and amazing organization. Actually, I was one of the speakers in 2020, two years ago. Uh, regarding your question, let me say my last sentence first. As Ibn Haldun says, you know, the geography is density and Eurasia is rising. This is, I think, the uh, main uh, or the last sentence that I would uh, say. Uh, if I say, uh, would say some things uh, like the theoretical background, uh, in recent years, two incidents, you know, have made big changes in economic paradigm and also in economic policies. The first one was the global financial crisis, 2008 global financial crisis, which has led to important changes in economic paradigm, not in policies mainly, but in economic paradigm. And the second one is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has, you know, uh, made big changes in economic paradigm and also in economic policies. Actually, if you remember, before pandemic, there was no any atmosphere which supporting the globalization. If you remember, the world agenda was the tension between US and China and trade wars. Uh, but with pandemic, just beside the disease, uh, you know, effects, this uh, supply and logistic issues, you know, uh, has created a big trauma in Western nations, especially. And uh, the disease side of the pandemic will be ended, of course. Uh, but I think uh, the trauma, which, you know, uh, mainly uh, caused uh, by the uh, supply and uh, uh, supply and logistic issues, will last uh, for uh, some decades. And this period, in this period, Eurasia region, uh, you know, has uh, very important opportunities and, uh, you know, it, uh, it can, you know, uh, it is, uh, its role, very important role, the balancing the global relations, uh, not only economic and trade relations, also the global uh, political relations and also can play like a bridge between Eastern and Western uh, countries because uh, in this new era, I strongly believe that there will be some shiftings in the supply and uh, logistic centers, in the map of the supply and logistic centers. And these all changes, you know, puts forward only one region, which is Eurasia. Uh, also, some other world issues, problems like security, immigration, uh, refugees problems, also this you know, uh, Eurasia region can play a very important role. And another thing, I think, in this period, I don't want to, you know, take uh, much of time. In this period, I believe this Eurasia region, if they, they imply the correct economic policies, they will attract a huge amount of FDI. Because many Western uh, companies and also Asian companies, Asian companies, that, you know, uh, targeting the Western markets, European markets, I think, they may shift their investment to the Eurasia countries. Eurasia, I mean, you know, this, uh, the east part of Europe and west part of Asia, actually. Eurasia, which is Istanbul, is in the center. Mm -hmm. And, of course, <laughs> it would, uh, Astana is one of the center. Budapest is one of the center. There are, of course, some other centers. And this new era, I think, it will be era of regionalization. Not uh, so. I, I, it will be unrealistic, in my opinion, to say that the globalization would make some progress in this period. Of course, this is my last sentence. Of course, the uh, global political, economic, and trade relations among countries at the global level would, you know, would last at a certain level, but there will be no progress in globalization. And this is the conservatization age and, uh, you know, protect protectionism age, actually this started with 2008 uh, global financial crisis and with Trump policies, so we, we could see 
those, uh, you know, uh, uh, conservatism in the uh, trade policy. Now, if you look at the world, the United States before the pandemic, the United States was like conservatist country and China was globalist countries <laughs> in the uh, world trade uh, terms. Uh, thank you again. This is what I can say in the first round. Yes, I agree because, you know, the COVID has changed a lot of things. And even when we started to feel the first, it was the supply, the supply chains. So I want to ask you, Mr. Bora Elms, the rapture of the supply chains uh, due to the pandemics being widely studied, expert around the world, expert of international trade, especially the Southeast Asian uh, region. So in your view, the, what is the measure can we take record over the supply chain ecosystem are at the doorstep of the complexity transform to the value chain system. What do you think about this? It's an interesting question, and I, I want to say, again, thank you for having me here, and I'm delighted to be here on behalf of women especially, so yay. <laughs> um, supply chains, I think, is very interesting. One thing that I find especially notable is that I've heard a lot of central bank governors give speeches over the years, and they never as, I, as far as I can recall, talked about trade, and they certainly never mentioned supply chains until the last couple of years. And now all of a sudden, central bank governors will spend half of a speech, as we heard, especially from Thailand this morning, talking about trade issues, supply chain issues, disruption, how do we grow from here. C-suites, which never paid attention, I mean, they, of course, they paid attention a little bit to supply chain issues and trade issues. They never had it at the C-suite level, really, until recently. And so this is an issue that has moved from of concern to a few to sort of top-level priorities for both policy and for business. And I think that is a reflection of the times that we live in. It's not just the pandemic. Of course, the pandemic, as we certainly all are well aware, has caused all sorts of disruptions. And you know, part of our panel can't be here because of travel restrictions that remain in place. Uh, those of us who are here from Asia are experiencing a very different pandemic, I think, than those of you from Europe. So we've had varying responses to the pandemic, but we certainly have experienced, as a collective, real shifts in supply and in demand. It's happened simultaneously, and it happened globally. That has, again, elevated this issue to the top of agendas for policy and for business. Now, the question is, of course, where do we go from here? How long will this remain a top priority for these individuals uh, who have limited attention spans because they're very busy doing lots of things? I think it's unclear. I mean, there's, a, there's an effort to say that globalization is dead and that we are now moving into a period of reshoring or onshoring or friendshoring or nearshoring, find your favorite word. I'm not convinced. I think if you look at the data, it's, it's, it suggests already that supply chains continue to be in place that, at a global level. Some are being moved. Many of them are being strengthened, though. So we have you know, sort of impulses to pull back. At the same time, we have impulses to diversify. And I don't think at this point in 2022, we can say yet with confidence what we think the final picture will look like. And even if we could, it's a bit out of any one individual's control. So it's very nice for governments especially to say, we want a supply chain that looks like this. We want it to be resilient. We want it to be flexible. We want it to be inclusive. Of course you do, right? Like whoever in their life said, what I want is a brittle, inflexible, rigid, non-inclusive supply chain. No one, no one ever said that. <laughs> and so of course we all want that outcome, but the question is how do you get there? And I think it's important for policymakers especially to recall, it's businesses who make supply chains. It's not government. So you, business is looking to make supply chains that are resilient and flexible for them, but they also have to be done at a reasonable cost. And especially as we head into real strong economic headwinds, inflation and so forth, it's very hard to decide how to shift your supply chain um, and what makes sense that's going to be sustainable in the long run. And so I think for policymakers, and I'll just finish up here, for policymakers, what are you trying to do then? The key goal for policy, in my view, is to make sure that the economic conditions for your economy are as supportive as they can be for whatever comes next, to allow supply chains to be flexible, resilient, inclusive, et cetera. 
If your government does a good job of creating those necessary operating conditions, then you will be part of supply chains. If your government does a terrible job and creates protectionist, backwards, um, non-open policies, then you will not be part of supply chains. Whether they are regional or whether they are global, you will be out of that game. And I think as we go forward, we need to remember that supply chains make a difference for all of us. None of us would have survived COVID without them. Uh, and so we want to make a policy environment that supports that rather than a policy environment that frustrates the development of sensible supply chains for the future. Yeah, I think it's important for the governance and uh, to the central bank of uh, the different countries. So even for the central bank of Hungary and Hungarian government to make for this decision is good. So thank you for your answer, uh, Mr. Bora. I want to ask is Mr. Cheng Su from the Fudan University, the representative for the School of International Relations and Public Affairs of the Fudan University. So very research of including emerging role of the China in the new world order. So could you please introduce the focus, the point, the focus points of the China's foreign policy uh, in 2022 and how this point influence of the Eurasian uh, cooperation? Thank you very much. Could you hear me? It's okay. Yeah, we can hear you, but... Okay, yeah, it's clear, right? Yeah. So, uh, I think uh, over the last decades, China's uh, foreign policies, one of China's foreign policies is very uh, 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 emphasized about the rule of uh, Eurasian uh, continent. Because uh, uh, due to this panel uh, we talk is about uh, the, geo, the, impa uh, the uh, <clears throat> impacts of geopolitics uh, about uh, the Eurasia uh, collectivity. I think uh, over the last uh, decade, uh, there are two phases of the world. One is the trend of anti-globalization or anti-regionalization. <clears throat> uh, um, <clears throat> the other trend, uh, is uh, global, uh, new globalization and the new regionalization, which uh, uh, more or less motivated by Eurasia uh, continent uh, uh, countries. So uh, uh, the former uh, uh, two scholars just mentioned about the uh, supply chains. I think uh, uh, as a political scientist, I think uh, 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 the policy chains uh, may be very important uh, for or for current international relations and the Eurasia uh, regionalization, because I think uh, the last decade we can find a, a, a important phenomena which uh, mostly occurred uh, in the United States, uh, in the United States and uh, uh, EU countries. Uh, I called this phenomena is. Uh, uh, is a uh, uh, double uh, level uh, confrontation uh, politics. Now, for example, uh, in the United States, we can find uh, 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 a mutual veto system, a uh, grid lock politics, uh, polarization uh, against the uh, party struggle. It is domestic politics. Uh, so uh, when the United States wanted to do something in international relations, uh, it has to be faced about uh, its domestic uh, mutual veto system. Uh, it means uh, it has to take a non-cooperation policy uh, in international relations. I think this phenomenon phenomena is also happened uh, in EU countries uh, uh, because uh, uh, in terms of the uh, EU domestic uh, uh, institutional arrang arrangements, uh, it looks like uh, uh, a mutual veto uh, system. So uh, this is a major reason uh, for us to see about uh, the, uh, uh, the the disruption of policy chains uh, in the United States and uh, uh, the EU countries. Uh, so I think uh, this is the one phase of the world uh, we can find uh, that uh, uh, it is difficult for the United States and the EU countries to take cooperative uh, action uh, in international relations. I think it is uh, 
uh, uh, not useful for a good uh, global governance. But on the other hand, we can find uh, the other face of the world, which occurred mostly uh, among around the uh, Eurasia uh, countries. Uh, so uh, uh, we uh, we can uh, often uh, uh, we can find uh, more and more countries around the Eurasia uh, uh, continent um, began to take action uh, to facilitate uh, about. There's a pause. All right, so it's, I hope it's a technical solve, uh, the problem is solved. I, I want to continue. So I think it's, wait a little bit. Okay, so let's continue uh, with Mr. Harry Tillman. So it's the researcher, the familiar with the impact of the BR, uh, Better Road Initiative across the important of this China's investment were represented the Chinese FDA data. So how is, does the Better Road Initiative support the cooperation Eurasian currently? And how do you see the question for like globalization versus regionalization? So which will be the future? So um, I hope this story is okay. If not, I'll cut it. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So I look at the FDI in three different ways. One is China outbound, China led outbound. Two is China with a little bit of leading uh, support outbound. And the third is China inbound. The first of those was last weekend with SCO. Now those of you who haven't followed Shanghai, Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, it's now 25 years old. And um, it now has its ninth member, which is Iran. It represents 60% of the European Eurasian landmass. 40% of the world's uh, population, and 30% of the world's GDP. And for the first time, it's gone from protection, terrorism, protection, et cetera, into proactive working together of nine countries working together. They've, they have formed an investment fund across all nine countries. They've launched a agricultural policy across all nine countries, and they've chosen, led by Iran, to go to uh, a um, Chinese currency to help facilitate trade. That was China-led, and before this was, and by the way, if you want to learn more about this, it's on CGN, CG, CGTN's website. We published it today. So China-led, and even before SCO this year, there were two major um, um, rails options around Russia led by China. So that was really China-led for the past 25 years. A second, and almost as important, where China played a small role is that we call the Abraham Accords. And those of you that are not aware of them, it was really um, led by Jared Kushner and Trump, believe it or not, um, before they left office in 2020. And this originally this is Israel um, and UAE, and it then involves Bahrain, um, Morocco, and Sudan. Sudan is certainly currently out because of the change in management of the country of Sudan. And what happened there is there's been a huge flow, cross-border flow of so 75 years of people killing each other are suddenly piling into technology to grow rapidly. We provide that data for the Italian government, the UK government, and the Israeli government. It's a really fast-moving exercise, and, and China's played a very small role in that. In fact, China's been kept more or less outside of that. And the third piece within that is within that area, you heard from GCC this morning, uh, China's played some role in that, but more importantly, they've played a recipient role. That's China inbound. Um, so you've had, within that one, you've seen UAE, UAE and Saudi sign up for SCO, which you talked about before. You've seen UAE and Saudi sign up for the Abraham Accords, and now you see UAE and Saudi pouring money into Southeast Asia and our friends in Thailand that were here this morning, um, and um, China itself, $35 billion from Saudi Arabia into China, where they won't even speak to Biden. And, uh, and also into Morocco. So you've seen a huge flow of Islamic finance coming from the Gulf into Southeast Asia. So very interesting. One role China leads, and that's now 25 years on its own. Yes, and the other roles are much more passive and they're recipient of it. 
I think it's important for the gateway region to start rising right. for this new decade. So for next round, I want to focus on three main questions. The first around the supply chain. So that during the COVID-19 pandemic, some areas, even after the pandemic, supply chain disruption caused serious issues, issues such as rising oil price, the energy questions, the increasing inflation. What affecting to the economy at the same time? So can this impact moderated, if it's yet how? And the, part, the second part of the question is, did the Belt and Road Partnership contribute the restoration, this change by the different area? So I want to start with Deborah. What do you think about this? Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to answer the second question. I'll leave that to my panelists. On the first question, you know, what are the challenges now for supply chains? Clearly, a lot of companies recognized as a result of the pandemic that they had some challenges in their current supply chain footprints or their supply chain footprints circa 2020. And in particular, many firms discovered that they were unusually exposed in some areas. And usually, it was not the thing that you imagined was the most urgent. So if you had a supply chain for, I don't know what, a television screen or something, it was not the high-tech parts that often broke in your supply chain. It was the plastic housing, it was the little screws, it was something that was not obvious as a vital component that turned out to be a major problem for you. So a lot of firms have tried to investigate their own supply chain. They know that they're first tier suppliers, but they don't often know their own third, fourth tier suppliers, especially the small businesses that feed into many of the more complicated products. And a lot of companies spent a lot of time figuring out what is it that we, who do we even get things from? And it turns out often there's one critical supplier of screws or plastic components or something. And it, it may be the case that it's not just you who uses them, it could be all of your competitors actually use the same firm or the same general group of firms because there aren't very many global suppliers of the thing that you need. So that a lot of firms discovered this to their dismay and then tried to figure out what do we do about that. So the first part was knowing that it happened and then the second part is what do we do about it. And for a lot of firms there aren't a lot of options. Because there's a reason why you procured, in many cases, the screws, the parts, the plastic holdings, the buttons, the, you know, fill in the blank, what is the thing you're making, from where you did. And you often did it because they're very good at it. The firms you were using were good at whatever it was they were making, and they were very efficient, and they made it at a fairly low cost, and you had procedures in place to procure those products quickly. And now that you have potential disruption on the way, you have to look for an alternative. And at a time of especially stronger economic headwinds, that shift from who we used to use to finding someone else who could do it for us is actually much more challenging than I think the popular narrative suggests, which is, of course you will diversify. Of course you will not be so reliant. But when a firm has to look around and say, well, wh where am I going to get, you know, cheaper, I don't know what, buttons or ribbons or plastic pieces, they often discover it costs them like six times more to do it from someplace else. And so at the end of the day, I suspect many firms will do this whole survey and there will be a lot of money spent internally in companies looking and they will come right back to where they started <laughs> and they will say, we will procure from the same people we used to. Maybe we'll procure 90% and we'll procure 10% from this very expensive local producer just as an insurance policy. And then at some point, I suspect, in another couple of years when the memories of COVID have faded, firms and especially boards and particularly investors will say, well, why are your costs so high with this 10%? <laughs> you should d d get rid of those people and go back to the ones who are much more efficient. And at the end of the day, we will end up, I think, with footprints that look remarkably similar, despite all of the rhetoric and all of the incentives to what we currently have, because it's too hard to shift, especially when you are trying to control costs. So we'll see. I could be wrong on this. Then there are some firms who say, especially for geopolitic reasons and especially for some products, we cannot continue with the same supply chain because the risks are too high and we have to actually look like we're delivering in case there's a disaster. Um, but for most products, 
which are less sensitive, I think at the end of the day, you will end up with similar kinds of supply chains, which is why my advice to governments always is make sure that your policy settings fit your ability of your companies, especially your small companies, to be part of these global supply chains. Because otherwise, you miss, when they're looking for an alternative, you miss being the 10%. I mean, 10% is better than zero. So you know, we want to start with the 10%, and eventually, maybe you turn yourself into a much more valuable supplier of whatever that thing is. But given the importance of small businesses to every economy, you need those SME sectors to be part of supply chains in order to grow. Thank you very much. Mr. Bagun? Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, as I said in the first tour, uh, besides the diseases, uh, you know, uh, diseases effects of the COVID-19 is uh, the supply and logistic issues of pandemic, you know, has created a trauma in Western nations, Western countries. Even if the COVID-19 would end in terms of, you know, uh, health issues, I think this uh, trauma regarding the uh, supply and logistic issues uh, will last for some years, you know, maybe some decades. Uh, so in this regards, so Western countries need to create or need to find new uh, supply centers, supply centers, maybe logistic centers. That's why, you know, many experts, they expect there will be some shifting in the supply and uh, logistic or, or trade centers uh, in the world. Uh, so in this context, the Eurasia region, I think, you know, provides a huge potential for Eastern countries, for the you know, East part of the world, and also for the Western economies, countries, especially in terms of logistic issues. You know, before the pandemic, just one example from uh, Turkey, I think it's the same for uh, almost all countries. Uh, one container, uh, you know, if you know, shipping a uh, cost from uh, Asia, you know, far Asia to Turkey was around uh, 3,500 US dollars before the pandemic. With pandemic, it increased to 15, 16,000 dollars. Now I think nowadays it uh, started to decrease again, but still around 9,000, 10,000 US dollars. So if you know ship uh, some things from East Asia or Far Asia to United States or Europe, you know the cost, logistic cost is the, always there is you know risk for logistic issues. It is quite far. So the Eurasia, that's why you know I said that some uh, Asian companies may also shift their investments to the Eurasian countries, to this region, because in terms of logistic issues and also. Uh, in political issues to balancing the world political tensions, this uh, you know region uh, provides a huge potential. Regarding the inflation, I think this uh, MTR prices may you know go down. Uh, the, we all hope that the war uh, will end and the energy prices also would go down. So the logistic cost yes. may would go down. Uh, so inflation maybe decreased, but I think. Actually, you know, as an economist, in my opinion, this uh, strategy of most of central banks in the world you know, fighting with, uh, against inflation is not correct because this uh, inflation is mainly uh, you know, caused uh, from cost inflation. It is uh, not demand inflation, so increasing uh, uh, interest rates may not you know, decrease inflation, may also increase inflation. You know, there are uh, in the literature also many discussions like the monet modern monetary theory, etc. Anyway, so uh, even if the inflation would be moderated, would be managed by many you know, uh, Western countries, central banks, I think this would not prevent Western countries to find new supply centers and you know trade centers. So this shifting in in the map of the trade and supply centers will continue, and these all changes will put you know uh, put forward the Eurasia region. But the governments in Eurasia region should you know imply the correct policies. They should you know uh, support their uh, domestic production. They should you know imply the correct intensive. Uh, subsidize, you know, programs, especially, uh, you know, support to the uh, technology-intensive uh, production, like the case of South Korea. We have many uh, speakers from South Korea uh, at this forum. So, creating, you know, producing 
new technologies, innovative technologies, and then start to export those. So in these terms, if Asian companies shift their investments to this region and, you know, produce the innovative technological products in this region and export to the Western countries, so this would also support these countries because this is also a very important uh, factor in the, in the process of the developing of Chinese economy also. You know, many Western technological firms shifted, uh, you know, their investments to there and produced technological like Apple, for example. So it means it's like logistic so, yeah. and location, yeah. if it's yeah. important. So yeah. I just want to uh, ask very shortly, uh, how is the Baton Road partnership uh, contribute the restoration, the chain in different areas? So Mr. Su, just a short question, uh, answer. Well, <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> I think uh, trade and investment between China and uh, Eurasia continents, countries are increasing over the last uh, uh, years. Uh, uh, because we know uh, uh, since uh, the outbreak of uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19, uh, it, uh, it uh, do uh, uh, affect uh, uh, international trade and the investment uh, over the last uh, uh, three years. Uh, and uh, the, other, uh, the other factor also affect uh, uh, the uh, international trade and the investment is, uh, I think, uh, uh, the factor of uh, uh, geopolitics, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, maybe could be called as the back of the, uh, the camp confrontation politics, which is uh, likely the Cold War, uh, because some countries want to uh, want to uh, facilitate uh, the back of the uh, Cold War uh, in Eurasia uh, continents. I think that will be uh, dangerous uh, for uh, the future of Eurasian countries. Uh, uh, collectivity and, and in terms of China, China want to um, put forward uh, 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 the development of uh, Eurasia uh, countries uh, trade and uh, uh, investment. Uh, so uh, that is uh, uh, an important uh, uh, direction of Chinese foreign policy. Uh, uh, Can I deal? Yeah. <laughs> Can I just you know, take two minutes to yeah. describe this to you? So China has come up with a brilliant plan which will not make the healthcare industry happy, but it will put medicine in people's lives around the world. So China first helped Algeria in healthcare in 1963. It built its first hospital in Afghanistan in 1975. So last year, and Norbert and I work with, uh, work with them on this, I've, I've co-published three documents with the Chinese government on this, but beginning last June, 29 countries were authorized to take Chinese medicine, Chinese uh, COVID uh, jabs into the local countries to be manufactured in partnerships in the local countries, to be distributed in the local countries. They have the rights to, to do this. U.S. will not do that in the U.S. or the U.K. And since that time, additional, additional countries have signed up such that this year, uh, about two to three billion of additional jabs will be made available in local countries, by local countries, with cash in stay in those countries, many of those in Eurasian countries. And by next year, it's five to six billion of additional jabs. And one of the leaders of that will be Egypt. Yes, and then of course, Uzbekistan, and uh, throughout Myanmar, through many SEO countries, are all local. So this saves a fortune for locals. Now, number one, number two is longer term, it's just a matter of time before HEP A, HEP B, everything else is being manufactured there, it will have a drastic effect long term on Western ability to price medicine. Mm -hmm. So it drives it, and it, oh, since it's local, it can convince local people how to use it versus dropping it. Thank you. So I just want to have uh, 11 minutes. So I have two more uh, topics for the focus. The first about the global cities, mega region, the hubs. I think this is important. So the first, you know, the United Nations wrote about 28 mega cities. My new book is Geofusion 2.0. I, I uh, describe 64 global hubs. What is important is uh, 44, including of Eurasia. 
21 in Europe and 23 in Asia. So what do you yeah. think about, especially Asia, the growing number of the global cities, mega cities and city clusters, uh, such as Great Bay Area, Shanghai, Chengdu, uh, Chongqing, Seoul, Singapore, how I call this a uh, Kitsing Chi axis for the new innovation area of the world for the southern uh, Eurasia. So what do you think about them? the main factors emergence, what can expert the world stage from this global cities, the hubs, uh, how they're influencing the trade and economic relation. I want to ask uh, Mr. Bilgin and Deborah just a very, very short question. And second point after, the technology hubs can to help by this kind of hubs. Well, I, I believe mega cities will, you know, uh, continue to dominate the world trade, uh, you know. Uh, but if we, we look, to the mega cities, uh, almost all of them, you know, they have sea or ocean connected uh, cities, uh, and so this region, Eurasia region. So I mean, the eastern part of Europe and also central and, and eastern part of Europe and Western Asia. So the only, I think, the negative issue in this era for uh, this region, they have very limited, just a few mega cities maybe Moscow or Istanbul, I think. So this region also should increase the number of mega cities because this region has connection with seas, with, you know, uh, Asian Sea, Mediterranean, and Black Sea also. So, uh, yeah, mega cities would uh, dominate the world trades, I think. Thank you. Deborah, just one minute question. I, I think they can be very helpful, but it depends because obviously the, the larger the city, the harder it is to get around and so forth. So for manufacturing, megacities may deliver. They may also create some challenges. But what they do do that I don't think we give them enough credit for is they aggregate people. And the more that you aggregate people, the more likely it is that you will end up with services especially. And we never think enough, I think, about services and the importance of services in delivering future supply chains, supply chains in services, for services, and that's gonna become increasingly important. So the advantage of megacities and open uh, talent policies around in bringing in new kinds of people is that you can then create a real hub for services development, which we have not focused on as much because we've been so focused on trade and goods. And so for the future, I think megacities as that aggregation of talent or potential talent, I think that could be really important. And I think even the China, for example, the Great Bay area is a very technological intensive uh, zone. So how did the technology support the global cities, the global hubs, the new centers, the politics and economics? Mr. Tillman and Mr. Su, one, one minute for a short answer. I short time. I don't yeah. that's, Mr. Su? I defer. I'll follow. For around minutes. Uh, I'll follow. Uh, it's uh, I think uh, uh, because uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the mega uh, cities, uh, I think uh, most people uh, emphasize the importance of uh, hardware infrastructure. Uh, I think for Shanghai or other mega cities in China, we begin to uh, uh, emphasize the importance of uh, the building of the software uh, infrastructure. It's a link to global uh, cities. Thank you, Mr. Tillman. 5G is the answer to smart city. <laughs> but I want to also add back to the importance of Eurasia. There will be a time, probably not in our lives, but our children's lives, but all that rail between Europe and Asia, all the roads, all the lorries, all the cars will all be digitized, driverless, digitized, nuclear powered. That's how far China thinks ahead. And that's what's going to happen, I believe and it's all a function of digitization and data. Thank you very much. For the last question, last round. So speaking about regionalism versus globalization, how is the new trends of the regionalism influence the global markets and the resilience gain from the diversification? So I just want to I would say keep an eye on Asia. <laughs> I think that the re Asian integration, which has already been very strong, is getting additional boost from lots of different factors, from geopolitics reasons, from domestic reasons, from integration efforts by Asian governments. I think the 
in Asia for Asia phenomenon is likely to grow and continue. And so the challenge for other sectors or other regions, I, I suspect, is how do they connect to the growth engine that remains Asia? Uh, and if you're not attached to that growth engine of Asia, then can you develop some kind of competitiveness in something that makes your region important? Uh, because I think that's, that is, at least for the near term, that's where I think growth will be found, is in Asia. Thank you very much. Mr. Bilgin, what do you think? Regionalism is rising, I think, will be rising. So this new era will be, uh, you know, the time of the regionalism. Of course, the global political, economic and trade relations will last at a certain level. So it doesn't mean, you know, the globalization will cut tomorrow. So it is, of course, a process. Uh, but uh, I know I don't any uh, progress uh, in the globalization. Uh, it will be regionaliz uh, regionalism period. And uh, if I'm not wrong, a Chinese uh, saying says, so uh, each crisis creates uh, new uh, opportunities. So COVID-19 crisis also, you know, creates new opportunities. And I think in this new era, uh, this Eurasia region should, uh, you know, uh, use uh, these new opportunities and, you know, increase its impact, political impact and economic trade relations uh, impact. Thank you very much. Mr. Su, what do you think about so, the... uh, I don't agree with uh, one point that uh, globalization and uh, regionalization is dead. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Eurasia collectivity will be an uh, important factor to facilitate the fish new type of uh, regionalization or globalization in the future. Thank you very much. Mr. Tillman? Uh, ASEAN, number one, I mean, it's another one trading partner for China. It's, it's arisen from number three two years ago. So ASEAN, player number one, 11, 10, soon to be 11 nations. I mentioned SCO the importance of the Delta in trade and SCO. Uh, but I wouldn't underestimate Latin America for China, and I wouldn't underestimate uh, Africa. But it's, in, in the markets we're talking about here, cer certainly SCO number one C uh, and SCO number two. And Russia is also an important one. I know we shouldn't talk about this, the R word, publicly, but uh, the, the, uh, there is a huge amount of flow between, uh, between China and Russia in, in oil, and that's not going to change up, not down, and also Russia and uh, Russia and India. As I think is always is an important or interesting question, how would you see the words like bottom up and top down? So it's, uh, I think if you are like the organic growing is like institutes, cities, global cities, nation and connectivity. And I started my presentation, the three passwords in this decade is connectivity, complexity, and sustainability is so important. And even, I think, it's the Belt and Road Initiative. It was very interesting because the Shanghai Corporation, it was in, in last week, and the Belt and Road Initiative is in Central Asia, in Uzbekistan, in Tashkent. And the Belt and Road Initiative started in 2013, September, in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia, too. So I think in our decade, because the world order starting, Eurasia start to rise together, to getting more connected. Uh, to make for the more stronger cooperation, even after the COVID-19, uh, sustainability, safety, regionalism is getting stronger. So it's like uh, the, ver the, the earth is like pulsing, so it's getting focusing more and after the connect. So this is occasion that we are told that the future have to focus for the long-term sustainable Eurasian connectivity, what is a mean complexity and sustainability together. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to, to join us in the panel, the geopolitics versus regionalization, about the supply chains and the cooperation of the Eurasia of the future. So I want to say to Mr. Tillman, Mr. Chu, uh, uh, Mr. Bilgin, and Deborah, and Mr. Elm, Ms. Elms, to, to being with us. Thank you very much to, to join us. And I wish for the great conversation address to the lunch break. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chismadia. This was indeed a dynamic discussion and we had several stimulating remarks from our speakers. As our second panel has come to a close, we are going to have lunch break, then move to the last session today, focusing on infrastructure, connectivity and technology. After lunch, our speakers will discuss how logistics, infrastructure and technological developments serve to have more competitive and a circular economy. The keynote speech that we missed can be viewed online if anyone's still interested, so we hope you are. And for our guests who are here with us at the venue, we hope you enjoy your lunch and that you get a chance to discuss these topics furthermore. We see the opportunities, uh, we see the necessities uh, to launch a new creative uh, vehicle called uh, CBDC. The design features and safeguards around a CBDC, they do have to reflect best internationally prescribed standards, among others for financial stability, cyber resilience, and financial inclusion and access.
for researchers like myself who uh, look at the political economy of finance and financial technology, Shanghai is uh, definitely an important location and one that shouldn't be missed. Uh, so Fudan being in the, at the heart uh, of Shanghai, both at the academic and uh, market side uh, of finance, makes a big difference. Shanghai is uh, definitely a very good destination for foreigners to visit this country and to learn about China. It's been really great to meet so many people across the Fudan community, from undergraduates to graduates to postdoctoral scholars and professors. And I think the space here at FDI is wonderful to work at. I've been able to work at different coffee shops in front of the lawn around Guanghua Lowell in this building and it's just been a wealth of people, ideas and places here that I've been very grateful for. As a university academic, there's a danger that we would stay in a small circle of people who think the same way, that we live in the library. FDDI as a think tank was very useful for me to uh, meet people in the business sector, meet people in political sectors and I could bring their opinions into my research. The international environment for the job market is uh, very difficult uh, at the moment for early career scholars and I really wanted something that would give me an edge. Uh, and in fact, the FDDI program provided me with that edge. What I liked about FDDI was that I, I had a chance to meet other experts of several areas and also the audience at my two presentations uh, was quite interactive, which I liked. For example, at my presentation about the, how the Belt and Road Initiative impacts the energy security of China, we discussed security issues involved. Uh, we have a very unique style of work here. It's very friendly, academic, highly recreational and uh, interchanging. For example, we go out and see places, uh, we share our experiences of life together, we take photographs, we take videos, and then we laugh. So at FDDI, there was a lot of freedom to work. We had good facilities. The staff was really, really helpful. I think if you really want to do any good visiting fellowship in China, uh, FDDI gives you the best. It's pretty clear that, uh, that China and Shanghai and Fudan University is a very, very, very dynamic place. Have uh, never experienced such a dynamic uh, institution. As, uh, as Fudan University, and that's also encouraging um, for me. China is um, a leading power in um, economy, but uh, becoming very soon, I guess, also a leading power in academic research and teaching. The program is an epitome of the diversity in Fudan. We have brilliant people from both academia and uh, industry, and we have achievements in both research and uh, practices. Diversity is always the key word here in FDDI, and that is why how we win top talents and inspire great ideas here. Connecting, Connecting people, people, sharing, sharing knowledge. knowledge. Connecting, Connecting people, people, sharing, sharing knowledge. knowledge. Connecting people, sharing knowledge. knowledge. OMFIF, the official monetary and financial institutions forum, is an independent think tank for central banking, economic policy and public investment. A neutral platform for best practice in worldwide public and private sector engages. With teams in London, Singapore and the US, OMFIV focuses on global policy and investment themes relating to central banks, sovereign funds, pension funds, regulators and treasuries. Global public investors with investable assets of $39.5 trillion are at the heart of our network. Membership offers insight through analysis and meetings. OMFIF analysis draws on expertise from our in-house specialists and a global network of public and private sector members. Many OMFIF meetings held under the OMFIF rules take place within central banks and other official institutions. 
Over the last year, we have hosted high-level speakers, including the Chief Economist of the ECB, Federal Reserve Bank Presidents, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, the President of the Deutsche Bundesbank, and the Chief Economist at GIC, Singapore's Sovereign Fund. To join us as a member or to find out more, email Chris Ostrowski, Chief Revenue Officer, on the address on the screen.向未来的一切机遇与挑战，复旦大学将以一流大学的本质、担当为主线，提升育人和科研能力，为民主国家、全球立德树人，全面彰显社会贡献力。Shanghai Forum 2021 is requested to accumulate the collective wisdom. Indispensable in drawing a new future-oriented roadmap to guide a path ahead for Asia and the global community. As I'm highlighted by this year's theme, the Asia has an important role to play. The Asia demonstrated a remarkable resilience during the pandemic. We need the Shanghai Forum. 发出亚洲声音，融汇全球观点。我们相互理解差异，重塑共识，这代表了我们的韧性，有利于亚洲和世界全面复苏的更快到来。And my main theme, which I like to emphasize always, is global cooperation. This is no time. For geopolitical conflict,、uh, this is no time for divisions between the major powers. This is the time for global cooperation. If if all of us, 7.8 billion, are on the same boat, and then we are suffering these common problems of COVID-19, we are suffering the common problems of climate change. And what we should be doing is cooperating. The pandemic has shown that the distance from basic research to innovation is indeed shorter than we often envisage. We believe that science and innovation will be strengthened through a more continuous collaboration. Asia values emphasize social and national interests. 优先于个人的利益，同时，国家要尊重个人。民主的关键不是一人一票，而是选出好的政府，真正为人民服务的政府。That's what we call CBDC. These are sovereign currencies. These will be the dominant force in the new global monetary system. Now, the new coronavirus can be seen in the global scene. We are more than ever needed to cooperate with each other. 沟通与理解，团结与协作
Geopolitics, History, Economics. The book titled American Empire vs. European Dream by Gerd Matolci, the governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, has been released. Providing a broad perspective, it analyzes the process of how the American Empire became the world's number one superpower, what motivations other major players in geopolitics had, how the European Union attempted to compensate the hegemon status of the American Empire, and how the European dream shattered at the dawn of a new world order. You can find the answers to these questions, as well as many important and topical issues, in Gerd Matolci's new book, which has already achieved international success. The book is available in bookstores or online, in the web shop of Paulos Atene Publishing House, or on Amazon.com. Planet Earth is our home and our most valued treasure. It is the responsibility of today's society to preserve it for generations to come. Humanity is continuously seeking ways to do more in this regard. And Hungary, as well as MNB, must play its part in these efforts. According to an international survey, our country is currently the 19th amongst the European Union countries in terms of progress towards achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We still have much to accomplish in terms of clean energy, tackling climate change, and the protection of terrestrial ecosystems. In addition, relative to other European Union countries, our economy is more vulnerable to environmental issues. All this clearly shows that we must restructure our economy, in which MNB plays a key role by facilitating the financing of investments. We must support the adaptation of the economy and mitigate the consequences of climate change as well as reduce the funding of activities harmful to the environment. To this end, in 2019, MNB established the Green Program to support the domestic financial sector in measuring, managing and reducing the risks arising from climate change and other environmental degradation. We formulated new recommendations and regulations to reduce these risks as well as to expand green finance. Furthermore, 2020 saw the introduction of an innovative preferential capital treatment for housing loans to enable commercial banks to provide favorable mortgage loans for energy-efficient properties. In the corporate segment, MNB has been focusing on renewable energy and corporate green bonds by expanding the preferential treatment scheme while also placing special emphasis on capacity building. The Green Programme is also aimed at providing market players with an appropriate supply of professionals and expertise. In this regard, MNB is cooperating with various organizations to support multiple domestic and international training programs. And thanks to its professional assistance, four Hungarian universities have launched green finance courses. Apart from MNB's measures, the European Union regulations and global initiatives are also rapidly shaping our lives. The changes which have been set in motion might allow us to leave the planet in a better shape for the future generations.
Geopolitics, History, Economics. The book titled American Empire vs. European Dream by Gerd Matolci, the governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, has been released. Providing a broad perspective, it analyzes the process of how the American Empire became the world's number one superpower, what motivations other major players in geopolitics had, how the European Union attempted to compensate the hegemon status of the American Empire, and how the European dream shattered at the dawn of a new world order. You can find the answers to these questions, as well as many important and topical issues, in Gerd Matolci's new book, which has already achieved interna international success. The book is available in bookstores or online, in the web shop of Paulos Atene Publishing House, or on Amazon.com. The world is in change, global pandemic, volatile financial market, trade decline. How does Asia lead the world's economy in the new era? Boal Forum for Asia Annual Conference 2022. Together for development and a shared future for all. In October 1972, representatives from across the world met in London to sign the Charter establishing the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, known as YASA. It was the culmination of six years' effort by US President Lyndon Johnson and USSR Premier Alexei Kozygin and marked the beginning of a remarkable project to use scientific cooperation to build bridges across the Cold War divide and to confront growing global problems on an international scale. YASA was forged in the name of science diplomacy and today it still regards science diplomacy as a key tool to help build trust between nations and support foreign policies. Science diplomacy um, can succeed when other channels sometimes are not successful. I think the successes that I've seen and sometimes participated in gives me confidence that I think there's always a role to play for science diplomacy. Because I think the one thing that science has managed to do consistently throughout that period was to act as a, as a soft form of diplomacy in a sense, in other words, where it could actually open up doors, start conversations and start bridge building. Science diplomacy is shown in three dimensions. First, science for diplomacy. Scientific cooperation improves international relations. Second is science in diplomacy. Science provides advice 
to inform foreign policy. And third is diplomacy for science, when diplomacy facilitates international scientific cooperation. All these three dimensions are present at EASA. One example is EASA's project called Challenges and Opportunities of Economic Integration within a wider European and Eurasian space. In this project, we focused on the future of economic ties between the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union. The science for diplomacy contribution of EASA in this case was to bring parties with very different views into a dialogue. Through this dialogue, they built trust, which was very critical in the political reality of that time. A recent example of science diplomacy in action at the Institute is the YASA and International Science Council consultative platform. I thank the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the International Science Council for bringing us all together for the first advisory board meeting of the EASA ISC consultative platform. And the idea was to learn from what was happening from the COVID-19 crisis, uh, to see if we could look at some of the things that we could preserve. But the most important thing was to try to see if we could prioritize the areas for transformation that could help us to build a more sustainable an equitable world. Uh, within a fairly short period of time, we were able to put together um, online consultations that gathered some 350 experts in science, in, um, in practitioners, and in policymakers. We need to cooperate and collaborate more effectively than ever before. Yes, it has the potential, not just to be a player among others in science diplomacy, but it has the legitimacy to exercise global leadership. As a scientific institution, we can only put the scientific facts on the table. The science is not negotiable. What is negotiable is the way that that's used and the way that different countries or different societies may choose to harness the science for their own benefit. And there's always a little bit of room for maneuver there because at the end of the day, uh, political decision-making is not just about science. It's also about the economy and it's always going to be about people. It's not just about science. I think science needs to make its case. And science needs to put its best foot forward. And science needs to try and demonstrate why it's in the interest of societies to adopt uh, a worldview that, uh, that, that uh, embraces science. We see the opportunities, uh, we see the necessities uh, to launch a new creative uh, vehicle called uh, CBDC. The design features and safeguards around a CBDC, they do have to reflect best internationally prescribed standards, among others for financial stability, cyber resilience, and financial inclusion and access.
for researchers like myself who uh, look at the political economy of finance and financial technology, Shanghai is uh, definitely an important location and one that shouldn't be missed. Uh, so Fudan being in the, at the heart uh, of Shanghai, both at the academic and uh, market side uh, of finance, makes a big difference. Shanghai is uh, definitely a very good destination for foreigners to visit this country and to learn about China. It's been really great to meet so many people across the Fudan community, from undergraduates to graduates to postdoctoral scholars and professors. And I think the space here at FDI is wonderful to work at. I've been able to work at different coffee shops in front of the lawn around Guanghua Lowell in this building and it's just been a wealth of people, ideas and places here that I've been very grateful for. As a university academic, there's a danger that we would stay in a small circle of people who think the same way, that we live in the library. FDDI as a think tank was very useful for me to uh, meet people in the business sector, meet people in political sectors and I could bring their opinions into my research. The international environment for the job market is uh, very difficult uh, at the moment for early career scholars and I really wanted something that would give me an edge. Uh, and in fact, the FDDI program provided me with that edge. What I liked about FDDI was that I, I had a chance to meet other experts of several areas and also the audience at my two presentations uh, was quite interactive, which I liked. For example, at my presentation about the, how the Belt and Road Initiative impacts the energy security of China, we discussed security issues involved. Uh, we have a very unique style of work here. It's very friendly, academic, highly recreational and uh, interchanging. For example, we go out and see places uh, we share our experiences of life together, we take photographs, we take videos, and then we laugh. So at FDDI, there was a lot of freedom to work. We had good facilities. The staff was really, really helpful. I think if you really want to do any good visiting fellowship in China, uh, FDDI gives you the best. It's pretty clear that, uh, that China and Shanghai and Fudan University is a very, very, very dynamic place. I have uh, never experienced such a dynamic uh, institution. As, uh, as Fudan University, and that's also encouraging um, for me. China is um, a leading power in um, economy, but uh, becoming very soon, I guess, also a leading power in academic research and teaching. The program is an epitome of the diversity in Fudan. We have brilliant people from both academia and uh, industry, and we have achievements in both research and uh, practices. Diversity is always the key word here in FDDI, and that is why how we win top talents and inspire great ideas here. Connecting, connecting people, people, sharing, sharing knowledge. knowledge. Connecting, connecting people, people, sharing, sharing knowledge. knowledge. Connecting people, sharing knowledge. knowledge. OMFIF, the official monetary and financial institutions forum, is an independent think tank for central banking, economic policy and public investment. A neutral platform for best practice in worldwide public and private sector engages. With teams in London, Singapore and the US, OMFIF focuses on global policy and investment themes relating to central banks, sovereign funds, pension funds, regulators and treasuries. Global public investors with investable assets of $39.5 trillion are at the heart of our network. Membership offers insight through analysis and meetings. OMFIF analysis draws on expertise from our in-house specialists and a global network of public and private sector members. Many OMFIF meetings held under the OMFIF rules take place within central banks and other official institutions.
Over the last year, we have hosted high-level speakers, including the Chief Economist of the ECB, Federal Reserve Bank Presidents, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, the President of the Deutsche Bundesbank, and the Chief Economist at GIC, Singapore's Sovereign Fund. To join us as a member or to find out more, email Chris Ostrowski, Chief Revenue Officer, on the address on the screen. Shanghai Forum 2021 is requested to accumulate the collective wisdom indispensable in drawing a new future-oriented roadmap to guide a path ahead for Asia and the global community. As I'm highlighted by this year's theme, the Asia has an important role to play. The Asia demonstrated a remarkable resilience during the pandemic. We need to and my main theme, which I like to emphasize always, is global cooperation. This is no time for geopolitical conflict. Uh, this is no time for divisions between the major powers. This is the time for global cooperation. If, if all of us, 7.8 billion are on the same board, and then we are suffering these common problems of COVID-19, we are suffering the common problems of climate change, and what we should be doing is cooperating. The pandemic has shown that the distance from basic research to innovation is indeed shorter than we often envisage. We believe that science and innovation will be strengthened through a more continuous collaboration. The dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, the Chinese RMB, and so forth, the pound, British pound, will all have a digital version. That's what we call CBDC. These are sovereign currencies. These will be the dominant force in the new global monetary system. Planet Earth is our home and our most valued treasure. It is the responsibility of today's society to preserve it for generations to come. 
humanity is continuously seeking ways to do more in this regard. And Hungary, as well as MNB, must play its part in these efforts. According to an international survey, our country is currently the 19th amongst the European Union countries in terms of progress towards achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We still have much to accomplish in terms of clean energy, tackling climate change, and the protection of terrestrial ecosystems. In addition, relative to other European Union countries, our economy is more vulnerable to environmental issues. All this clearly shows that we must restructure our economy, in which MNB plays a key role by facilitating the financing of investments. We must support the adaptation of the economy and mitigate the consequences of climate change, as well as reduce the funding of activities harmful to the environment. To this end, in 2019, MNB established the Green Programme to support the domestic financial sector in measuring, managing and reducing the risks arising from climate change and other environmental degradation. We formulated new recommendations and regulations to reduce these risks, as well as to expand green finance. Furthermore, 2020 saw the introduction of an innovative preferential capital treatment for housing loans to enable commercial banks to provide favourable mortgage loans for energy-efficient properties. In the corporate segment, MNB has been focusing on renewable energy and corporate green bonds by expanding the preferential treatment scheme while also placing special emphasis on capacity building. The Green Programme is also aimed at providing market players with an appropriate supply of professionals and expertise. In this regard, MNB is cooperating with various organisations to support multiple domestic and international training programmes. And thanks to its professional assistance, four Hungarian universities have launched green finance courses. Apart from MNB's measures, the European Union regulations and global initiatives are also rapidly shaping our lives. The changes which have been set in motion might allow us to leave the planet in a better shape for the future generations.
Geopolitics, History, Economics. The book titled American Empire vs. European Dream by Gerd Matolci, the governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, has been released. Providing a broad perspective, it analyzes the process of how the American Empire became the world's number one superpower, what motivations other major players in geopolitics had, how the European Union attempted to compensate the hegemon status of the American Empire, and how the European dream shattered at the dawn of a new world order. You can find the answers to these questions, as well as many important and topical issues, in Gerd Matolci's new book, which has already achieved international success. The book is available in bookstores or online, in the web shop of Paulos Atene Publishing House, or on Amazon.com. The world is in change, global pandemic, volatile financial market, trade decline. How does Asia lead the world's economy in the new era? Boal Forum for Asia Annual Conference 2022. Together for development and a shared future for all. In October 1972, representatives from across the world met in London to sign the Charter establishing the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, known as YASA. It was the culmination of six years' effort by US President Lyndon Johnson and USSR Premier Alexei Kozygin and marked the beginning of a remarkable project to use scientific cooperation to build bridges across the Cold War divide and to confront growing global problems on an international scale. YASA was forged in the name of science diplomacy and today it still regards science diplomacy as a key tool to help build trust between nations and support foreign policies. Science diplomacy um, can succeed when other channels sometimes are not successful. I think the successes that I've seen and sometimes participated in gives me confidence that I think there's always a role to play for science diplomacy. Because I think the one thing that science has managed to do consistently throughout that period was to act as a, as a soft form of diplomacy in a sense. In other words, where it could actually open up doors, start conversations and start bridge building. Science diplomacy is shown in three dimensions. First, science for diplomacy. Scientific cooperation improves international relations. Second is science in diplomacy. Science provides advice 
to inform foreign policy. And third is diplomacy for science, when diplomacy facilitates international scientific cooperation. All these three dimensions are present at EASA. One example is EASA's project called Challenges and Opportunities of Economic Integration within the wider European and Eurasian space. In this project, we focused on the future of economic ties between the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union. The science for diplomacy contribution of EASA in this case was to bring parties with very different views into a dialogue. Through this dialogue, they built trust, which was very critical in the political reality of that time. A recent example of science diplomacy in action at the Institute is the YASA and International Science Council consultative platform. I thank the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the International Science Council for bringing us all together for the first advisory board meeting of the YASA ISC consultative platform. And the idea was to learn from what was happening from the COVID-19 crisis uh, to see if we could look at some of the things that we could preserve. But the most important thing was to try to see if we could prioritize the areas for transformation that could help us to build a more sustainable and equitable world. Uh, within a fairly short period of time, we were able to put together um, online consultations that gathered some 350 experts in science, in, um, in practitioners, and in policymakers. We need to cooperate and collaborate more effectively than ever before. EASA has the potential not just to be a player among others in science diplomacy, but it has the legitimacy to exercise global leadership. As a scientific institution, we can only put the scientific facts on the table. The science is not negotiable. What is negotiable is the way that that's used and the way that different countries or different societies may choose to harness the science for their own benefit. And there's always a little bit of room for maneuver there because at the end of the day, uh, political decision making is not just about science. It's also about the economy and it's always going to be about people. It's not just about science. I think science needs to make its case and science needs to put its best foot forward and science needs to try and demonstrate why it's in the interest of societies to adopt uh, a worldview that, uh, that, that uh, embraces science. We see the opportunities, uh, we see the necessities uh, to launch a new creative uh, vehicle called uh, CBDC. The design features and safeguards around a CBDC, they do have to reflect best internationally prescribed standards, among others for financial stability, cyber resilience, and financial inclusion and access.
Dear all, welcome back to the Budapest Eurasia Forum 2022 Hybrid Conference and a warm welcome to those who have just joined us. The forum continues with our third panel, which is titled Logistics, Infrastructure and Technological Developments in the Service of a Competitive and Circular Economy. the videos so we're just going to continue with the upcoming segment which is the fireside chat it is my great pleasure to welcome mr zoltan chefavai head of the center for next technological futures school of economics at matthias corvinus collegium starting the panel we will hear a very interesting fireside chat discussion between mr zoltan chefavai and mr rek wan chung director of the ban ki moon foundation for a better future and Professor Emeritus at Incheon National University. Mr. Chief Havai. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Chief Havai, it is our pleasure to have you here. Do you think that the next fireside chat discussion can approach climate change from an alternative perspective? Definitely sure that 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 will be a uh, very exciting uh, fireside chat because uh, Mr. Chong is one of the most prominent thinkers on climate change, but maybe he would say rather on climate crisis, and I think that what we will discuss uh, in detail. Okay, thank you very much. The floor is yours. But just beforehand, a short introduction. Uh, Professor Chang is a board director of the Ban Ki-moon Foundation for a Better Future and the lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on Technology Transfer, for which he received a personal copy of the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 2007. He served as the first climate change ambassador of Korea and as principal advisor for climate change for UN Secretary General. He also pioneered the concept of the green growth since 2005 uh, as a new paradigm to present the climate change as an opportunity for economic growth and job creation. Now, Professor Chang, undoubtedly, uh, one of the biggest issue of our time that uh, concerns, uh, I think everybody, our daily life, is the climate change. So what do you think are the main reasons for our failure in mitigating climate crisis? Uh, though, because uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was adopted in 1992, exactly three decades ago. So what are the main reasons for it? What do you think? And second, what are the key areas where we absolutely need urgent changes in this regard, and how could we level up the current initiatives? Thank you very much. First of all, let me express my special thanks for this opportunity to join you. Uh, very interesting forum, and uh, the very important question from uh, Professor Sepal Bay that uh, I have been involved personally in climate change uh, negotiations since '91. So I have been spending almost about three decades engaged in climate negotiations and promoting a new paradigm to address climate crisis. But uh, when I look back, uh, unfortunately, I think I have to confess 
that we did not make a big success, or rather frankly, we made a failure in addressing and mitigating the impact of climate crisis, as we have noticed during the past summer. The main reason when I was thinking about what was the main reason why we failed so far is because we have been focusing on the responsibility of the government and the responsibility of the business and industry. And at the same time, we focused on reducing emission from production. In other words, GDP. These are the three elements that international community has been focusing on to address the mitigation issues. But we have felt very clear limitations in mobilizing political support for the government to take a strong action for energy transformation. As in all democratic society, it's not easy for democratically elected government to push through costly energy transformation. So there's a political limitation. And for the business, also there is a market limitations. All the businesses are competing. The competition is getting intense and intense day by day. And how can we expect the business to observe all those extra costs of a carbon emission reduction into their uh, price. So this is also, there's a clear limitations for the boundary that the business can observe the responsibility. And also the third point of the production side. As all in the government, as all governments, uh, reducing GDP is a disaster, political disaster and social disaster. But if we target GDP as a source of mitigation, then which no government can manage to only reducing and risking the uh, political difficulty of reducing the GDP. So this is the very real fact that the international community failed to come with their tangible results. And the clear example, for example, in 1992, UN FCCC, UN Climate Convention, agreed and even ratified, legally ratified, to reduce the CO2 emission of a developed country at the level of 1990 by 2000. But it never been uh, respected. And also in Kyoto Protocol, we agreed and ratified to reduce CO2 emission of developed the country around 5.2% by 2012. But it has never been respected as well. And also we agreed in 2009 at the Copenhagen. We agreed to reduce 20 to 40% of CO2 emission reduction by 2020. Uh, it was 2009. But 2020 is already passed and no country kept that promise. So these are the track record of the failures we made so far. And now we are in the process of making another commitment, which is called NDC. In the name of NDC, all the governments are making announcements about net zero or 2030 target, and even the government like United States, Korea, China, these governments are already making announcements for 2030 and 2050 and 2060. Is there any guarantee that these commitments or political statement can be respected? So there's no guarantee. I'm suggesting here that one very important element of addressing the mitigation issue is missing. That is the role or the responsibility of the consumer. Consumer is left out in this equation of a mitigation and also the consumption itself, the emission from consumption is missing out. So I think uh, in, order to, in order not to repeat the same mistake we made so far, we need to shift our focus from government, business, production to consumers and consumption. Uh, I think this is uh, one very important point I'd like to highlight. And uh, the second point, 
one very urgent issue, we have to make a big change in, in order to really address the climate crisis is we cannot continue the free market system that is treating climate, air, water, or free goods. In economic textbook, the conventional economic textbook is treating climate, environment, air, and water are free goods. And they are treating them as externality. We cannot no longer continue to do that. We need to internalize climate, the carbon price, and the air and water to be internalized into our market price. So I am arguing that we need to urgently shift from free market system that does not internalize carbon and environment into a sustainable market system where the carbon price and the environment can be internalized. So this is uh, easy to say, this is an issue easy to say, but very difficult to realize. So maybe in a, in a later on, I, maybe I can clarify how, what is my idea for you. Uh, thank you very much. Before we go into detail, uh, may I just uh, have some heretic statement? Because in my understanding, free market competition is the best incentive to innovation. And uh, you, we're looking back three decades ago. So what happened in the, in the last three decades is a digital revolution, uh, which uh, transformed tremendously the economy. And when we just look at the digital uh, revolution, one consequence is the dematerialization. This means we use less energy, we use less material, and the GDP is growing. And. Uh, um, but a problem is uh, what you highlighted. I think it is a little bit different. The basic problem is uh, rather that the technology is developing exponentially. Yeah? At the very beginning, it's almost unrecognizable. And after that, start to increase. Yeah? And just between us, uh, for human, uh, thinking this way exponentially is very, very difficult. We are very, very bad at maths when we look at that something always doubled, one, two, four, eight, etc. Uh, but how we change and develop our institution, it is linear. That is the way how we are thinking our life, starting in the school, university, family, working life, etc. That is how can we, we think humans. And that is how we change our institutions. So I think one of the basic problem in that case, rather this, this gap between thinking uh, how the economy, how the technology is developing, how we can modify, nurture, restructure our institutions. So my question in that case, uh, how do you think technological innovations such as digitization, I would rather say, can generate synergies with the policy innovations, because you are talking about policy innovation, which uh, is rather this linear way, and between us, that is, is, is rather this crap, and uh, policy innovation you just mentioned, such as new climate economy, green growth, and do you think it is possible to keep up with the current pace of digitization, which I mentioned it exponentially, and the technical, the technological development, isn't the pace too fast, uh, to effectively transfer theoretical solution, what you mentioned, uh, into praxis? Yeah, my comment is, actually no answer for that, but my comment is, you mentioned about the exponential technological innovation, but uh, even though technology develops innovation, uh, exponentially grows, but, at, but th th when you look back, even though the energy efficiency improves and we have a lot of digitalization, but because of the digitalization, on, on the one hand, it saves energy, but on the other hand, it increases the volume of usage. So uh, in, as a sum of the results, actually the total gross consumption of energy never decreased. So these, even though the, at, the, at the ground level, technical level, some energy saving can be expected from digitalization, but if you, if you think about the the, the, what is it, the Bitcoin and all this, you know, the mining of the Bitcoin and all these kind of yeah. things, consuming huge amount of electricity, right? So digitalization <coughs> is not a kind of a, a cure-all for 
energy or climate issues. It needs to be combined with the policy innovations. So the issue is, mm -hmm. how can you maximize the synergy between technological innovation and the policy innovation? So the two of them can com be combined to accelerate, to produce more uh, deeper impact in the mitigation. So that is a job of the government and society. So it's a very, very uh, huge challenge to, yep. to, to find that. And sorry, I'm a really very yeah. <laughs> technology enthusiast working in a center yeah. for next technological future. Yeah. Just came the, the, uh, the famous sentence of Yamani. Yamani was a uh, Saudi Arabia uh, mm -hmm. oil minister. He said the stone age didn't end mm -hmm. because we ran out of stone. Mm. Yeah. That's right. So we are always able to find new technological solution to, to our problems. But uh, your ideas uh, of policy innovation are very challenging. Could you a little bit uh, talk more about this personally determined contribution movement? Or okay. We know that, uh, that there is a nationally determined contribution of the mm. Paris Agreement, That's right. which is uh, unbinding uh, national yeah. plan aiming to climate change mitigation. Right. But how would look like in practice the personally determined contribution? Yeah. Actually, it, my idea of a personal determined contribution came out of a long uh, time thinking what can be the solution to break the impasse with the deadlock we are stuck in now. Uh, even though nationally determined contribution sounds nice, but uh, as I said, there's a political limitations of national contribution because the, they don't have a political support, enough of political support to come up with enough national contribution if there is no personally determined contribution is available. So in order to internalize the carbon price into the market price, the critical factor is whether the consumers are willing to pay the price because companies cannot absorb it, governments cannot just pay for by subsidy, it's not, it's not sustainable. The only sustainable solution is that consumers has to be ready to pay for the extra cost. But, but uh, interestingly, the public support is divided. Half of them doesn't agree, half of them support. Then my idea is that we can go ahead with the support from those who are willing to pay or observe the carbon price into their consumption pattern. And in Korea, 48% of the people are willing to pay higher price to meet the climate crisis for the electricity bill. So my suggestion is that let's give them a chance, an option to pay a differentiated price for clean energy. Yeah, just a short remark. So at the end of the day, uh, always the people are paying everything as taxpayers. The state doesn't have any money anyway, just uh, the right to impose taxes. Mm. So that means in that case, uh, how could you solve the problem that in that case we are paying twice? One are the taxpayers, and the second uh, is that that is a voluntary. Mm -hmm. Voluntary. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I will tell you one example. In Germany, the Ice, the train, yeah. Uh, there are different types of tickets. You can buy a green ticket, or paying extra money, then this extra money is used to buy a green energy, clean energy, electricity, to run the train. Some people are paying the extra money for the same seat, yeah. same travel. So this is a opening on giving an option to the consumers to make a voluntary contribution. And I think this kind of a case can be replicated in many countries around the world. Yeah, it's a very challenging. What you are saying in that case, some kind of, uh, of uh, based on the behavioral economics, rather mm -hmm. nudging people to, to have a behavior which is rather directed in, in this way. And you mentioned the ISA in, in, uh, in Germany, that is rather a, a choice architecture, how we mm -hmm. create the choices for, for, for people. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can choose. Yeah, what? it's a voluntary choice. Yeah. The very important point is not mandatory. It's just a suggestion and uh, up, absolutely up to the people to decide. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, just uh, my final question because step by step we are uh, running out of, not stones, uh, running out of time. And uh, my final question is uh, relates also to, to 
innovation. So what do you think are the most significant reasons for differences in innovation capacity between European and Asian uh, countries? And what advice would you give European governments uh, and companies to bridge these differences? <laughs> I think it's a very uh, too much a compliment for Korean innovation, but uh, <laughs> Asian innovation. But I'm I'm not sure whether Asians are better than the Europeans in innovations. I think, but but the one fact I can mention is that the social pressure in Korean society, because we have a very high population density, so the peer pressure seems to be quite high in Korean society. And uh, that might play a certain role in uh, incentivizing the people to come up with uh, some of the innovations. But for my own personal observation, many of the European countries are also very good at coming up with uh, a individual ingenuity. Uh, but in a country like a Korea, we come up with uh, some more, uh, for, uh, more based on collective compression and the collective uh, competition. So I think the uh, European style is more oriented based on individual ingenuity, while the, uh, some, in my case in Korea, the Korean case seems to be is a collective and the more social uh, peer pressure side. I think that's the difference, but I don't think uh, um, there's a big difference between the innovation capacity. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Uh, I had a possibility to serve uh, uh, Hungary as an uh, ambassador to the OECD, and Korea is at the table. And we discussed always when we uh, picked up the best example for, for innovation, Korea was always mentioned as the best example. So thank you very much to widen my knowledge in that case, what you think about why Korea is so. So thank you very much again for, for this uh, fire chat uh, uh, talk. We have seven, six uh, seconds, yeah. and yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair Favre, for leading this inspiring chat that established a great tone for the coming panel discussion. Now, let me invite Mr. Peter Feikisch, Director of Digitalization Directorate at MMB, who will moderate the panel discussion dedicated to infrastructure, connectivity, and technology. Mr. Feikish, welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chong and Mr. Chi Favai had a stimulating and thought-provoking discussion about climate change, and the panel discussion will undoubtedly go into more detail. Mr. Feikish, what do you anticipate will be the main takeaways of this upcoming panel? Well, uh, I think this, this discussion has also highlighted uh, the importance of digitalization, innovation, and the importance of implementation of new technologies, cutting edge technologies, to support both competitiveness and sustainability. Uh, so I'm quite confident that um, our distinguished panelists could really mention a few examples that, real examples, real use cases, um, that which solutions could support us uh, in both ways, which could support competitiveness and also try to uh, help us reach our goal in a sustainable way. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will sit and uh, so well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I would like to welcome you all in our panel discussion. Uh, it's a hybrid version of the panel discussion. So first, um, it's uh, let introduce our panelists. So first, uh, Mr. Chian Chu is a professor at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Nanyang Technological University. He's also the director of the Center for Urban Solutions. Professor Chu has more than 25 years research and consulting experiences in geotechnical engineering, in particular in the areas of laboratory, institute testing, engineering properties of soil, soil improvement, and rent reclamation. So please, Mr. Chu, join, up, join me to the panel. Our next panelist is actually Mr. Biliang Hu, who is joining us online today. So welcome, Mr. Biliang Hu, uh, who is an executive dean of Beijing Norma University's Belt and Road School, an institution created to cultivate the global talent for the Belt and Road Initiative, and to build a world-class think tank to support the initiative's rapid growth. He had prior uh, employment in the private sector. Welcome on board. 
Our next panelist is Mr. Lambin. Mr. Bruno Lambin is the president of the Smart City Observatory at IMD since its creation 2018. During his career, his research activities focus primarily on information technology, innovation, talent, and the role of smart cities. And also, he is an expert on indices, smart city indices, and a lot of others. Welcome, uh, Mr. Lambin, to our panel. And finally, our fourth panelist is Mr. Chiong Li. Uh, is a professor at the Graduate School of International Studies and the College of International Studies of the Korea University. His research mainly focuses on institutional change in water policy and water management with reference to China, Korea, Southeast Asia, and of course, Europe. Welcome on stage, so please join us. It's great to have you, have you here. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so let me start with a question to Mr. Chu. Um, in the case of sustainability, uh, soil and water, all of these basic elements are extremely important. And you have a huge experience in, in la land reclamation, soil improvement, a lot of other areas. So my first question would be that, uh, how do you see the future of geotechnology, the current state and maybe the future of geotechnology, and how could it could be implemented to the circular economy, actually? Thank you. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, for the introduction, and also thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, well, f firstly, uh, since I'm the only engineer here, maybe let me introduce uh, what is uh, geotechnology. Uh, geo means uh, earth or anything to do with the ground, and uh, of course you understand technology. So when you come to Budapest, when you land on the airport, so the pavement is built by geotechnical engineers. So when you come to the terminal building, the foundation is built by geotechnical engineers. So when you travel to the, to the city center, so the road is built by geotechnical engineers. So with the increasing importance uh, for climate change, higher demand for sustainability, and the role of uh, your technical engineers uh, has ever been so important or so vital to our economy, to the development of uh, uh, sustainable solutions. Uh, for example, for in Europe, for some countries are experiencing energy problems. So uh, geotechnical engineers have developed uh, alternative solutions, or at least we have contributed to the development of uh, sustainable solutions. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, geothermal energy from the ground. So instead of uh, you know, building a special system, uh, whenever we build foundation, we build our you know, underground tube, we build our you know, deep excavation, and some of the geothermal system can be incorporated. So in this way, uh, you will be more cost effective uh, for harvest energy. Another form of energy is uh, wind energy. And in Europe or in e Asia, such as China, or particularly in the US, when you go to California, go to the Mideast of uh, the US, and we have a lot of uh, and the wind farms. We use wind turbine to generate uh, electricity. Uh, what you need the foundation to ensure the stability of the wind turbines, particularly uh, in the middle of the sea, for example, North Sea, we have uh, I mean, big development uh, for energy. So those are the tasks of uh, geotechnical engineers. We actually have developed solutions for us to build you know, offshore wind turbines to generate uh, uh, electricity. I, I can give you another example, which is uh, sea level rise. Uh, from my country, Singapore, uh, I guess uh, one third will be inundated in water uh, if the sea level will increase uh, for half a meter. Uh, well, I believe many other countries are facing the same problem. For example, cities like Shanghai, Jakarta, uh, Venice uh, in Europe are facing the same problem. So uh, we need solutions. Okay? I mean one of the solutions is to build seawall and to block the water. But of course, you have other problems. So for example, we do have uh, urban flooding. So for example, I mean, Seoul was uh, flooded uh, just uh, not long ago, and we have uh, many other such situations. 
uh, we all have a drought problem uh, in California, and there's a lack of water. So to develop those solutions, uh, we need uh, geotechnical engineers. Uh, we need to develop uh, uh, economical methods or cost-effective methods uh, for a coastal defense system. Uh, for coastal defense system, we are not talking about a you know, few hundred kilometers of uh, seawall. And we are talking about you know, hundreds of uh, kilometers of seawall. Uh, so it is a huge invest. <coughs> Although my prime minister has announced that they're going to put in $100 billion for you know, coastal defense and to tackle sea level rise, uh, I'm not sure $100 billion is sufficient for uh, building uh, the, the complete coastal defense system for Singapore. So uh, one of the solutions is actually to have an integrated solution to combine the construction of seawall uh, with other functions. For example, uh, when we build a seawall, we can build a coastal reser reservoir at the same time. So for coastal cities like uh, Singapore, uh, we also have a flooding. Uh, like Venice, you have a flooding, but some problems with the flooding is uh, whenever there's a heavy downpour, uh, it happens to be a high tide, so the water cannot be discharged into the sea. So for this reason, we will need uh, a water catchment area to hold the water there first. So when we build the seawall, we can actually okay, build a coastal reservoir at the same time uh, to provide sufficient uh, water holding capacity. So for those of you who have been to Singapore, and uh, you know we have uh, a marina barrage, uh, which serves this purpose. But the only problem is our marina barrage is too small. So we need a, a big marina barrage. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also need space. Those who have been to Singapore, you know we're a small country. Uh, so as a part of the development, uh, we can actually build the floating platform as part of the seawall. Uh, with the floating platform, we will be able to you know, construct buildings, construct a new city center uh, using floating platform. And because it's a floating platform, it's just like a boat. So it doesn't matter whether the sea level is going to increase or not. You know, your building will always, uh, on top of uh, seawater, will always be, will be floating uh, on top of the sea. So this will be <coughs> a permanent solution to, to sea level rise. So if you combine all the developments together, uh, so it will be cost effective, so you will be able to generate revenues uh, for you uh, to use it to invest in construction of your coastal defense systems. Uh, what all yeah. those solutions uh, actually, you know, uh, is, uh, to me is a universal. For example, construction of seawall and uh, foundations for wind turbines. <coughs> and so if we have a, a collaboration, have a, a cooperation between East and the West, you know, it's just like this forum, uh, is for, and uh, we will be able to join force, and uh, we will be able to, to share uh, some of the R&D developments and uh, you know, to benefit uh, more countries, and uh, then to, you know, to, to make the whole uh, R&D system to be more efficient. Yeah. Thank you, actually, speaking about water, uh, Mr. Lee, I return to you that you're also an expert in, in water policy and water management, so how do you see that? How can we eliminate the potential drinking uh, problem or the drinking, uh, drinking water shortage actually in the future? Uh, it's also a part of a very important question of the sustainable system, uh, sustainable uh, water management. How do you see uh, this question? And maybe if you could share with us a few examples of how public and, 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 and private sector could uh, cooperate in, in, in this field. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the water issues are very cutting at uh, cut, uh, cut the all kinds of problems are combined, and the as you know the water and sanitation issues are the essential things we need to resolve. And having listened to uh, pr the Professor Chong Lei Guan, that the climate change issues and also other some related issues, of course, water is maybe the most important factor we need to think about because there's close linkage between water and climate change. And because of that, UN also they, um, a few years ago, they talked about the water development report that major theme was water and climate change. That is a big picture. And under that water and climate change issues, we need to think about varieties of water issues, water shortage, water supply problems, 
also the, uh, Professor Chu just mentioned about this on water-related disasters, which is um, related to sea level rise. And also then we need to begin to think about how do we have some more resilience to cope with all these challenges. Also, you pointed out water shortage. And then in order to cope with these challenges that uh, so far the supply side and also particularly the, the government, central government dominated policies and all the products have been um, everywhere. And not only about uh, developing, but also developed countries too. But then of course, private sector participation has been very important in, in not only about the Western countries, but also East Asia. And China is a good example that's the emerging market, and many private companies are involved at the providing water services. Yes, there are some good and results about providing I mean, better water flow rate, and also the, some people they have better access to sanitation services. Um, but also I can uh, refer to the one good case from Korea, and also related to some uh, technological innovation, uh, which is we call that smart water management or smart water grid. Jeju Island is the, uh, I believe that the most exotic island in Korea towards destination. And so then the recent few, uh, about 10 or 20 years, more and more tourists coming from not only Korea, but also neighboring countries, China and Japan or other countries and small islands, and they becoming just too many people. And then they require too much water too. But the island itself is uh, naturally, they have the volcanic rock system. Uh, because of that, they have the uh, natural filtering system, and also they got plenty of water every year, like strong precipitation. So they never worried about the water shortage. But nowadays, because of the too many people coming into Jeju Island, they realize water is running out. So they think about how to solve this problem, and they talk to the K Water, which is not entire private company, but public uh, bulk water supply company. But then they also involve some private uh, the water uh, businesses. So they ask them to come over to have a look. Uh, then evaluate then how we can really uh, solve these problems. And that they, what they uh, provide there was that, yeah, why don't you adopt that some smart water technologies? And for example, installation of uh, smart meters and smart sensors, and also the think about the how to provide some information to not only they dominated by the company, but also providing data information to customers, which is connected nicely, uh, neatly connected to Professor uh, Chang Legon, he mentioned that these consumers, they should have some their own rights and to access to data information and then changing their consumption behaviors. So anyway, the practically, uh, also in the current uh, data show that until uh, recently, that flow rate in uh, Jeju Island was only about 40%. But then of course, K-Water, they have the very grandiose scheme to improve up to uh, more than 80%. That will provide a huge advantage for that Jeju authorities to then we can provide more water or very clean water to the people. Also, uh, in the, at the same time, they may not be able to, uh, to use so much resources, uh, which requires new uh, infrastructures and also other, some other uh, some investment. And so then we can think about the big picture, the public-private partnership, bring in some new ideas, and we can encourage or empowering consumers' participation. At the same time, technological advancement and also the authorities, maybe they may have some policy innovation in the future. Yeah, thank you. I think this is an excellent example of the importance of innovation. And talking about innovation, I would turn to you, Mr. Hu, uh, that um, since 2013, uh, nearly 150 nations have already participated in the projects of the Belt and Road Initiative. And how do you see that, how does the BRI contribute to the expansion of the innovation capacity of, of the participation nations or countries or even regions? So what typically innovative and green projects have been realized so far? So if you could share with us a few examples, maybe. Okay. Thank you so much, Peter. I think these are very good uh, questions. Two questions. I would like to answer your questions by Combining the two questions together are very much tied to mingle with each other. Before I answer your question, I just uh, try to provide uh, some relevant uh, general information about innovation uh, capacity in China. According to one of the very important uh, index, hello, one of the uh, you know, participants, uh, the panelists, Professor Nan Bin. It's very good in uh, index research. You know, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. According to one of the very uh, important uh, innovation index, 
uh, issued by by the world intellectual property organization. You know, there's a innovation index, right? According to the latest report, 2021, China was ranking, uh, let me see, 12, year 12, a uh, little bit higher than Japan, but still lower than US, lower than uh, Germany, lower than France, uh, right? But if we compare with 10 years ago, China, China's ranking at that time, uh, that's a 2012, was only 30, 34, okay, 34. But now is uh, 12. So that means China's uh, innovation uh, capacity has been uh, significantly increased over the past 10 years. Actually, if you look at the list of rankings in the top 20 countries, China was the only one, you know, countries from the developing world. You know, all the rest of uh, Latin countries, they were developed countries. So that means China's capacity, innovation capacity, provide a very good fund, you know, base for other countries, you know, based on the Belt and Road Corporation. As you mentioned that, so now there are, there are, there are 149 countries working with China together. So 150 countries working together on the Belt and Road. So one of the very important, you know, forecasts for the cooperation is innovation you know, cooperation or innovation transfer, innovation expansion through many different ways under the, uh, you know, Belt and Road uh, uh, construction uh, cooperation or framework. Number one, for example, if you look at investment, talking about the Belt and Road, of course, you know, we're thinking first about the investment. Huge investment over, over the past, uh, you know, the nine years, as Peter just mentioned that, since 2013, past nine years, China invested into Belt and Road countries the total roughly about the one trillion US dollars. So huge investment investment project, you know, have been done over the past nine years, which involve a lot of innovation, uh, you know, uh, transfer innovation expansion. For example, China's investment into some of the you know, power station construction, like the hydropower, like the wind power, like, uh, you know, and new energy, renewable energy related, okay? Solar power, nuclear power in uh, Pakistan. So which involve a lot of uh, innovation. So that means once China building this kind of huge projects together with the countries, that means China's, you know, the technologies, like new energy technologies and innovation, your know, methods has been also transferred to, to their countries along with the huge, you know, uh, projects uh, building in the countries. I just mentioned the power plant, but also high speed train is on the way, you know, in uh, Indonesia, for example, from Bandung, Jakarta to Bandung. This is a high, high speed train. So we we'll also involve the high, high tech, right? And then China now railway, the lot of railways, and then uh, Mombasa and to Nairobi, as you know that the railway already finished. And also bridge, a lot of bridges have been building up, also involve a lot of, you know, innovation, technology innovation, you know, to share with the countries, okay? This is the one, the innovation transport through big investment projects. Number two, you know, uh, innovation transfer, innovation expansion through China's exports, you know, uh, I mean, the equipment uh, exports to the countries. For example, we export a lot of equipment for, for oil exploration and also for, you know, procession of the crude oil. Some of the countries, they have oil, but they don't know how to, you know, uh, to pro process. And then China helped them to do it. Okay, it's also involved some technologies and also, you know, generate the new value added to share with the country. So that's, uh, you know, based on the exported advanced equipment to the countries. Uh, okay, the third example is, as you know that, based on the Belt and Road, a lot of industry park, science park has been building up in different countries in Cambodia, okay? 
there's a special zone in the capital, the near the, the capital. Okay, uh, there's a industrial park, big industrial park, 120 square kilometers in Belarus, which is called the Great Stone. Okay, and then also China Thai Royal Industrial Park, uh, you know, in the place which is very close to Bangkok. So China has been jointly building a lot of more than 200 industrial parks, science parks in more than 100 countries. So these kind of, uh, you know, cooperation also involve a lot of uh, innovation transfer, innovation expansion, right? And then um, the fourth example is the China's innovation expansion based on Belt and Road is to, you know, the technical transfer of some of the important uh, technologies. For example, uh, hybrid, hybrid seeds of rice, which, uh, you know, uh, is very important, uh, did a very good job in China. China export this kind of, use this kind of uh, advanced technologies, advanced hybrid seeds for rice production in African country, the yields increased one to three times. So this is good to making sure the food security of these countries. And then these are some of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, examples. And one more, you know, some, there's so many examples. And then some special, you know, programs under China, for example, Laos, we have, you know, started uh, 10 pilot programs on, on the control of uh, carbon, carbon emission. So why, what are called uh, pilot programs of uh, carbon control with, uh, you know, with Pakistan, with uh, Myanmar, with uh, Laos, right? This is some special, you know, cooperation programs. And then, of course, China building also jointly building some science, uh, you know, science, uh, uh, science lab and technology lab with uh, some countries. So far, 53, a joint lab has building up. The typical example of building the science lab jointly with Egypt on how to, you know, uh, uh, on smart irrigation, okay? And also building joint lab, science lab <coughs> with focus on ocean, you know, production, you know, ocean science. Anyway, so these are some of the areas, uh, you know, China has been uh, working with other countries based on the Belt and Road Corporation, uh, which uh, you know, play a very important role to, to reduce uh, carbon, carbon emission at the same time to increase the productivity in agriculture and also in non-agriculture sectors. These are some of the uh, you know, uh, 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 facts and elements for Peter's question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lam, when you have mentioned actually, and was also the expertise in, in indices. So, how do you see that? Will European or Asian countries uh, could come to the forefront of, of the innovation and the and and the smart city concept? And maybe what what factors does this depends on? So, what what could be maybe you can see also you could also mention a few examples that which could be interesting for us. Definitely. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me insist first on how. Uh, struck I was by the words used by Mr. Chung in the uh, fire chat uh, talk we had just before this, uh, this panel. Because rarely I've heard someone express so clearly what has been done, why it failed, and what needs to be done. Uh, and it does not mean that what was done was wrong. Uh, it means that what was done did not take into account all the parameters of the equation. So clearly, and I totally agree with Mr. Chong, uh, what we need now is to add to innovation, which very often is reduced to technological innovation, other kinds of innovation. And that includes political and social innovation. Now, just to give uh, a concrete illustration, if, on one hand, you have uh, a 17-year-old going to the General Assembly of the UN and say, how do you dare? On the other hand, you have a 60-year-old, I'm talking about me, not Mr. Chung, because he's much younger, of course, um, 
who says what we need is internalization of the environmental cost. Who do you think is going to make it to the social networks? Who is going to get an echo in the population? This is part of the problem we face. How can we be concrete with something that requires some degree of analysis of abstraction to be solved? That's one part. Uh, then uh, I want to express my gratitude to the previous speaker for mentioning the Global Innovation Index. Uh, as some of you may know, we will be launching the 2022 edition next week in Geneva, on the 29th, actually. So I cannot disclose uh, the rankings for this uh, year, and I will not do it. But I think that uh, the uh, numbers that have been mentioned for China are indeed very striking. If we look at the rankings of GII since its creation 14 years ago, uh, when we published the first edition, I remember the very first session we had, uh, I said, oh, Switzerland is number one. And everybody will say, of course, they are number one. The uh, index is being produced in Geneva. So you have to be grateful to the host <laughs> country. We'll see next year how the real ranking comes. And after 14 years, Switzerland is still number one, which becomes quite boring. Uh, but uh, fortunately, changes are happening in the middle of the ranking. When we see the path taken by China, the path taken by India, which is much lower in the ranking, but also growing very, very fast, we realize that the part of the world where we have the center of gravity of demography is also becoming a center of, of gravity for innovation. That is changing a lot of things. If, on the other hand, you consider the very strong correlation that exists between GDP growth and innovation, you realize that it is very likely that Asia, the Asian region, will remain the engine of global growth in the coming years and probably coming decades, then you have an innovation equation which is bound to change the world. If I bring the two together, what we heard about how to deal with the environmental crisis and the landscape of innovation, we end up with a very simple conclusion, which is that innovation has been very much about doing more with less. Now we have to learn to do better with less, which is very different from the innovation equation we had before. It's not about productivity. It's about internalizing externalities. It's about delivering value. It's about fighting inequalities. It's about inclusion. And it's about mitigating climate change. The equation is far from simple. It requires understanding, it requires education, and it requires cooperation. So one area in which uh, I am particularly concerned right now is the collapse of multilateral discipline, the collapse of a number of international agreement, student exchanges, research exchanges. I'm afraid that the world resilience which we hear more and more often, becomes synonymous with protectionism and with shrinking to national borders. We need to counteract in that area. And to finish, and because you hinted at it, uh, I do believe that cities, whether they are smart or not, uh, maybe we'll come back to that later, cities have an increasing role to play. We've seen during the COVID crisis, many governments, and I will not quote any, uh, reluctant to act or late or slow in their action. And we've seen cities taking action, uh, organizing vaccination center, organizing point of distribution for masks, for gel, uh, etc. So we've seen cities coming to the fore because there was a crisis. We are starting to see the same thing regarding the environment. And I do believe that it will not be cities versus nations, but it will be cities playing roles that nations have ceased to play. They are more agile, and central government are becoming very tolerant about letting their cities 
uh, experiment. Uh, they are ready to stop the experiment if it goes too far, but they're very happy to see some agile entities taking risks. So this is where smart cities come into the picture. Thank you. Um, actually, back a bit to, to, to the cutting edge technology. So uh, Mr. Chu, Mr. Hu, and Mr. Lamvin, um, so how do you see the what cutting edge technologies could, could help us actually to, to support us actually to, to, to a more sustainable environment, to, to, to support the circular economy? Or maybe do you see any differences in the short run? And maybe a few examples which could be more potential in the long run. Mr. Chu? Would you would you start? Well, in the short run, I believe clean water and clean energy uh, will still be the top priority. Uh, in the long run, uh, smart, sustainable, green construction materials, as well as the use of uh, AI, use of uh, digitalization, uh, automation for construction, uh, will revolutionize uh, the construction industry and uh, the economy and uh, the whole market uh, related to construction. And if you look at uh, the shares of construction, uh, this is not uh, uh, a small uh, portion. Uh, well, I can give a few examples. Uh, for, exa uh, for example, for uh, sustainable construction materials, uh, we do, uh, in addition to cement, uh, we know cement is a common construction material, but we also know uh, cement uh, is probably uh, one of the biggest uh, generators uh, of uh, CO2. Uh, perhaps you don't know concrete is the second largest commodity. So we can imagine the amount of cement uh, used, uh, I mean, all over the world. But there are alternatives. So, for example, we do have uh, a reactive uh, MGO cement, which actually absorbs CO2 uh, from the air, so to strengthen the, the concrete itself. And uh, we are developing a uh, bio cement, which is using bacteria and using plant-based uh, enzymes and uh, using waste and to generate a uh, uh, cementitious uh, material. And combine, uh, comparing with uh, cement, so the bio cement is produced uh, under ambient temperature, so you don't have to fire it, you know, under 1,500 degrees, so it's a uh, very energy saving and uh, also is uh, very uh, cost effective. Uh, in fact, we have uh, I mean developed various ways. Uh, for example, we can use uh, carbon, sludge, uh, carbon sludge, which is an uh, industry byproduct, and combined with uh, wastewater sludge and the urine. Okay, it could be from human, it could be from you know, animal. Okay, we can produce uh, and bio cement and use it, for example, for coastal uh, erosion control, uh, coastal uh, development. And we actually have done a pilot test uh, in Singapore and to demonstrate and this uh, is uh, feasible. Uh, another Thank example is uh, smart construction. Uh, we, well, we, we have a smartphone, you know, combined okay, Wi-Fi with our phone now, you know, we can use it to do many other things. And same goes if we do 3D printing, we can actually incorporate all the smarts uh, systems into our construction, so in the future, uh, our beams, our columns will be able to, I mean, tell you whether the building has been stressed over the design limit. Uh, your facade will be able to automatically adjust, reject, you know, more sunshine, more heating during the summer, and may absorb uh, more sunshine during the winter, and to automatically adjust in you know, the energy balance, and to you know realize. Uh, uh, more energy efficiency and building. Uh, mm -hmm. So Thanks. combining with the use of uh, you know, zero carbon concrete, so we, we can have a, 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 a very uh, innovative, a very you know, carbon neutral and construction in the future. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hu, would you add? Okay. Uh, I want to deal very uh, briefly, because I'm not convinced uh, you know, to your dialogue with you guys. I try to keep it short. And cutting edge technologies, based on my understanding, so two uh, are very uh, important, they're very, cr very crucial. Number one is the green technologies to make the world cleaner. Number two is the digital technologies to make the world to smarter. So that's the uh, two types of technology. I think uh, 
are very important in the short term and also in the long term. The same. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lamvin, would you add to? Yeah, okay. the, regarding the, the technologies that will need to be mobilized and are the most promising right now, I think there are two generic technologies, which are artificial intelligence on one hand and quantum computing on the other hand, that needs to be considered as cutting across the board. That is whether you look at how you're going to finance innovation, to produce innovation, to disseminate innovation, these two will be called to the fore. So they will help us also transform the way we, in which we think about engineering, about construction, about irrigation. So all these will be extremely important. Yet, I would like to repeat a point uh, I was making before. It would be a big mistake to reduce innovation to technological innovation. If we look back at the past, there are two things we cannot uh, eliminate from our mind. The first one is that the most disruptive innovation over the last 30 years at least have not been technological innovation. They have been business model innovation. It is by changing the economic e equation between the input of the innovation equation and the output that disruption has been coming in. If you take uh, you know, disruption in the transport sector, uh, you look at uh, the, um, uh, the way in which taxes have been off-routed in so many countries. Uh, you look at the hotel business and what Airbnb did in that area. There's very little technology. There is data, clearly, but it is a business model disruption. So we're going to see that more and more in how we use innovation. And the second thing we cannot uh, take away from our mind is the timing of innovation. So many innovation have been labeled as failures in the early years and then became the world changers or the game changers 10 years, 20 years later. Um, we are often reminded of the uh, good old days of the competition between the US and the Soviet Union in space. And NASA has been spending millions of dollars to uh, create a pen that would write in a zero gravity environment. So the ink had to go down, but there's no gravity. How do you make the ink go down? And uh, at the same time, the Soviets in space were using pencil and paper. So it was described as, oh, the US has been wasting money for a problem that had been solved anyway. It doesn't need, but 10 years later, the whole pen industry has been changed by the discoveries that were made at that time. So something that was clearly a failure in the initial years became a big success. And we're going to see more of that. We need to leave room for failure. We need to tolerate failure. And to some extent, we need to finance failure. Thank you. Um, and sustainability is also quite connected to the mitigation of also the inequality, not only the environmental sustainability, but also the social aspects of it. And uh, I would turn to Mr. Chu and Mr. Hu that how, how could sustainable living environment could be created in the lower income countries along the RBI, the road and Belt and Road Initiative. So which sectors would need to be developed actually in the first place in these, in these countries? Mr. Hu, Mr. Chu, would you, would you start? Uh, I can start in some, uh, in the, with the audience. Uh, a circular economy uh, would be one of the solutions. So I'm very pleased that we are discussing circular economy today. Uh, once uh, we were developing a system for African countries uh, to use uh, agricultural byproducts, you know, agricultural uh, waste, and to generate uh, biofuel uh, through uh, paralysis system. So uh, at the same time, you generate uh, active uh, carbon for water purification you generate uh, calcium acetate and to make uh, bio cement I just uh, mentioned. Okay, once you have uh, bio cement, you can build your road. Once you build a road, you can connect to the other part of the world. So it becomes a circular economy. At the same time, uh, we do have uh, domestic waste. Okay, how to turn the waste uh, into value added uh, products to generate uh, you know, energy at the same time and to, you know, to convert 
uh, uh, domestic waste into uh, other means uh, uh, would would be important uh, for you know the economy, a uh, circular economy in uh, developing countries. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Hu. Okay. You? Uh, based on the Belt and Road uh, experiences, uh, the construction between China and the relevant uh, countries, uh, what is important? I think the most important and crucial you know, uh, job we need to focus on renewable energy, you know, because you know, some countries, low income countries, as you mentioned that, they have a great advantage in renewable energies, for example, in Africa, okay? And we can easily to develop in solar power stations. China has been building a lot of solar power stations in Egypt, in uh, South Africa, you know, for, for Middle East countries, they have a great advantage to build in like wind power, uh, you know, stations. In Southeast East Asia countries, you know, like Laos, as I mentioned that the Laos and uh, other countries and even Vietnam, uh, you know, uh, and Pakistan, we're building uh, some uh, hydropower uh, stations. So they are all, uh, you know, clean energies, renewable energies. This is very good, you know, uh, for them to save in investment relatively, you know, the investment is, uh, is less than, you know, other energies and also at the same time reduce uh, to reduce carbon emission. So that's, uh, that's a very good choice. And um, so this, I think, the job we can do. But of, co of course, then, then there was another uh, choices, but I just want to focus on this area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lamvin, you've mentioned several times the importance of social innovation. Uh, and what is the social attitude towards the long-term sustainable development in Europe and maybe, maybe in Asia? So what are the critical points here and how can we incentivize the stakeholders, SMEs, the companies, the big companies, um, you know, the, the normal citizens? How do you see this one? And I would also ask the same with from, um, from Mr. Lee. For me, that boils down to the very notion of what innovation is about. Successful innovation is always deeply rooted in culture. The, uh, you look at the uh, Arab world, for instance. Uh, in the Arab world, there is a very strong and ancient mathematical culture. Innovation that is linked to mathematics has a deep cultural rooting, as opposed to other areas which might be better fitted to other culture because there's more history, there's more experience. And of course, uh, we have a very ancient civilization around the planet, starting with China, where innovation started a long, long time ago. The rooting in culture is critically important. And when you deal with culture, you deal with social. You don't invent, or you don't create, or you don't educate in the same way in Singapore as you would do in the UK or you would do in Brazil. You have to take into account uh, the interest, the appetite for having been teaching for a, a significant part of my life. I know that there's no good or bad student. There are students that have an appetite to learn and students who have no appetite to learn. And your job as a teacher is not to teach, it's to give them the appetite. Then everything goes by itself. It becomes so easy. The same goes with the social dimension. We need to give everybody, our neighbors, uh, the people with whom we work, the appetite for change, the appetite for environmental transition. If it's described as a punishment, saying, oh, your grandfather lived better than you're going to live tomorrow, is going to be a very sad world with very dim lightning, with very uh, little opportunities to have fun because we have to save the environment, you're not going to create the appetite. We have to describe the future as something that we want, something that we are excited about, something in which we feel we're going to be happier. When you have the appetite, the social change comes naturally. Thank you. Mr. Lee? Uh, thank you. Mr. Langban just uh, mentioned about the, um, the original, uh, some of the, our common future, 1987, the definition of sustainable development, because uh, sometimes the 
um, some leaders and also some other people, they misleading the public that in order to make our environment better, you need to give up all the convenience, anything you can really enjoy at this moment. But that's completely misleading because the development that means the current generation without compromise, the future generation. That's the real uh, definition coming from our common future 1987. So then the, our job is that we need to think about from the bottom rather than from top down. Because today uh, we have the, all the important guests, important people from the central bank, all the powerful institution. The problem is sometimes we may forget the consumers. And also it's connected to Mr. Chang's point that uh, the, I, I, was, I was very surprised to hear that his uh, new terminology, personally determined contributions, they will be really uh, echoing that resonating what we're supposed to do. And also we need to empower that stakeholder participation and also the very good conversation between private sectors and also consumers at the, at the same time, ethical-minded people like environmental NGOs, then we may have some more better solutions rather than just focusing on from the top down. So we need to think about the bottom up. Thank you. Uh, I am quite cautious on, of time, so maybe as a closing qu uh, question to all of our panelists, that will be, uh, we started the day with the importance of, uh, our governor just mentioned the importance of cooperation, and I think the whole Europe, Eurasia is actually about uh, uh, cooperation. So what can Europe and Asia learn from each other uh, regarding the success factor of sustainability, the circular eco uh, economy, and so on? And Maybe how do you see what could be the most promising areas and which could be the most challenging areas? So maybe if we can start with Mr. Chu, please. Uh, well, for Singapore, I think the biggest challenge is the sea level rise. So I believe we will be able to develop uh, mitigation methods to tackle sea level rise. Mr. Uh, cooperation indeed is key. Uh, cooperation is all the more productive that it is diverse. If you bring to be together people with different experiences, you bring engineers, artists, medical doctors, you, give, you bring people from Asia, from Europe, from the Americas, from Africa, you have a much better chance to be innovative. Diversity is key. Uh, I consider that we are part of uh, what is known as a manual, that is a panel where you have only one gender. Uh, <laughs> and I think diversity also includes some of that. Uh, I happen to be French, and French is one of these languages in which uh, uh, the problem is masculine and the solution is feminine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee? Yes. I, I totally agree with Mr. Langban, just uh, collaboration between Asia and Europe. And I think also from Korean perspective, I think we are too much into technologies. Uh, I think we need to get out of the technologies and think about this some like a big picture and also more uh, non-physical infrastructure solutions, for example, institutional settings and also enabling environments and also taxation issues. Those would be uh, perhaps change people's consumption behaviors. Then we can learn many things from Europe because you have some uh, better regulation system. Thank you. And Mr. Hu? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, they, uh, I agree with uh, all of them. They said that. I just want to mention one thing. Let's work together regardless of Eastern or past or worse. We're looking for a new way of life. And also we're looking for the new way of modernization by the best balance between economic growth, social development, and environment, uh, you know, friendly. Okay, so that's what I, w I want to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now I'd like to thank you all uh, to be a panelist, for, uh, have, having you here actually, uh, either in physical way or in, or in online. So thank you very much. And mm -hmm. thank you very much to your audience. Uh, attention and of course uh, I think we had a quite uh, fruitful and thought-provoking uh, discussion uh, so dear ladies and gentlemen um, have a wonderful evening and, uh, and, and stay safe and now as a closing maybe after the panel we had the chance to 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 watch actually a short video on one of the initiative uh, from Singapore thank you very much and stay safe
Shooting City has been designed for Singapore, a collaboration with Nanyang Technological University and Shimizu, Japan. A 10 kilometer seawall sits across the coast and forms a protective barrier and water catchment area. The seawall also acts as a transport system with an expressway and metropolitan rail transit system connecting east and west Singapore. Using the seawall as anchor, a high-rise waterfront city comprising of commercial and residential buildings floats on a series of platforms connected to the main island. our third panel we have reached the end of today's professional program I hope you all agree with me when I say we had a successful and rewarding day our speakers have guided us through the most topical and intriguing questions of our time in the field of finance geopolitics and infrastructure connectivity and technology I wish you all a great rest of the day, and I hope to see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. on the second day of the Budapest Eurasia Forum 2022. Tomorrow we'll have a keynote conversation as an opening session, followed by further panel discussions on economics, multilateral cooperation, and education. If you missed any of the speeches or would like to rewatch our sessions, visit the Budapest Eurasia Forum website in the upcoming days as all our sessions will be available on demand soon. Thank you for being with us and have a lovely day.